Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Remco Rinkema, and you are watching Run It Back, the show in which we watch old school poker footage, sometimes from 10 years ago, sometimes from last year. And this week and today, I'm joined by Patrick Leonard, the man, the myth, the legend himself, both online and live. He's got some chops, and today we are breaking down the final table, as you can see, from the 2019 World Series of Poker. It is a $3,000 no limit hold'em event. So we're going to get into that and all that and much more. Please send your questions in the chat. Please like the video. If you enjoy the content, tell your friends about it. Uh, but first and foremost, Patrick, how are you doing during this strange year? Yeah, very good. Actually, I hadn't really been missing live poker at all, but this kind of uh, screen has been on for about 10 minutes whilst we've been waiting for the stream to start. Just staring at the Rio has kind of given me these flashbacks where I kind of miss playing against these angry, grumpy kind of people in Vegas on day 52. So uh, yeah, I'm doing well, kind of having some flashbacks now, which is which is good and bad, I guess. So yeah, it's very good to be here. Uh, for the people unfamiliar with your work and, and, and with all the things that led to you being at a World Series of Poker final table, give the people a little behind the scenes as to how you ended up being a poker pro. Yeah, I mean, my, my whole poker career all started from being just a fanboy. I used to watch World Series of Poker 10, 12 years ago when I was an 18-year-old kid. I remember very, very clearly when I was around 20 at university there was a thing called PokerTube. This is what was YouTube at the time. And you'd refresh at like 5 a.m., 6 a.m., waiting for things like High Stakes Poker or World Series to come out. And I was such a fanboy. I just engrossed myself in poker. And when you spend 10 hours a day thinking about something for 10 years, you just naturally become a little bit better every day because you're so engrossed. It doesn't matter if it's FIFA or World of Warcraft or poker. And luckily for me, poker ended up being a, a career for me. So, yeah, um, it's been... It's been one hell of a journey, that's for sure. We are watching the final table. You are second to last in chips. However, still some stacks pretty close to each other. We're rolling straight into the action, picking up pocket kings as the server tried to deliver you what looked like perhaps a coffee or a green tea. Um, you know, walk us through this firsthand. Let's kick things off right away. What do you remember about this moment? I don't remember this hand at all. Uh, <laughs> it must be at the very start. Usually when you have flashbacks to final tables, you think, oh, I was so unlucky here. I was so unlucky there. You don't remember, oh, yeah, I got dealt kings first hand. So this is actually quite interesting for me to see because I haven't seen this. Because uh, the table layout is kind of new to me. I'm kind of analyzing the stack sizes of where everyone is, who's in the big blind. Do I have to raise a different size to somebody else in the big blind versus what I'd planned? Um, if this was maybe, you know, two hours into the final table, I would maybe be a little bit quicker, but let's start the final table. I just want to make sure that my strategy is going to be kind of correct. I think also an important thing is not to rush decisions. Like you don't get many chances to be on a world series of poker final table. So I always tell people to really try to enjoy it. Um, like being in that, being in that moment, putting the chips in, like almost really feel that experience so you can visualize and think of it last time. But then I just said, I don't remember me even having kings that time. So I guess I'm not listening to my own advice there. <laughs> yeah, that's really funny. You look extremely focused. Uh, sunglasses, which, which I don't see that often on you. So we'll get into that in just a bit. But first and foremost, Wisco Baron in the chat. Daniel is there. Jess is with us on YouTube. I see Seth and Stanley and Chelsea on Facebook. Guys, please let me know where you're watching from. Let me know if you're entertaining the or enjoying the show and if you have any questions for Patrick both high level strategy or maybe you're a beginner you know let all those questions come out right now and let us know we are live on Facebook on YouTube and on Twitch so depending on what your favorite platform is you can find us on all in all these places going forward and this upcoming Thursday we're doing an, a, another view along of high stakes poker season 7 as we get ready for the debut of high stakes poker season 8 episode 1 December 16th exclusively on poker go the first episode of a new season which is going to be epic all right here's a spot um, small blind shove, King 10, you are in the big blind with Queen 9. Um, since we have a lot of beginning players, uh, explain your, your thought process in a spot like this, because clearly some people might think Queen 9, not a very good hand, but still quite a decision for you here. Yeah, so this guy um, is last in chips. You can see he has 400,000 and everyone else has 15, uh, well, 1.5 million, 2 million, 1.5 million, 4 million, 4 million. So he's really basically out of it. He has to play extremely reckless to have any opportunity to get back into things. If he folds for one more orbit, he's going to be down to like two or three big blinds. So I know that if it folds around to him in the small blind, he's probably going to be all in with almost any two cards. And whilst, you know, king, queen beats me, ace, king beats me, he's also going to shove hands like queen two, I think, nine, five suited, hands like six, five suited, hands like jack three suited. So I do really well against a lot of hands. I'm trying to kind of weigh up the risk and reward. If I call and lose, 
uh, I'm going to be the short stack along with him. And then I'm going to be away from all the other stacks. Whereas I really want to kind of stay in the mix, stay as one of the mid stacks, try to get up towards one of the biggest stacks. If I win, it doesn't change too much, right? Like if we look at the two chip leaders, they have 4 million. If I knock him out, I go up to 2 million. So it doesn't change my position in the tournament at all. So the risk reward for me is really bad, but the risk reward for him is amazing, right? Because either if he goes out, everyone expects it anyway. He's last in chips. If he if he doubles up, amazing. He can almost take me over in chips, take some chips off somebody who's going to play aggressively against him later on. So yeah, I think that's what I was thinking about. Uh, if I had queen 10, I would have probably called, I think. Yeah, that, that was the question that I had in my mind. Like, wh what's the cutoff point there? You know, do you call with deuces? Do you call with queen 10? Or, you know, does it have to be a, like a suited uh, a jack or something? Like, wh what, what are you thinking there? Well, you, you always want to dominate with both of your cards when you call all-ins, or you'd, you'd like to, of course. So the way that I think of it is, if it folds around him in the small blind and he looks at a 10, he probably thinks, okay, 10's a high card. I'm going to go with my hand. So if he has 10 deuce, he probably thinks, okay, if a dull Brinson will go for it. If he has 10, four, 10, five, he probably thinks, okay, high card. It's an okay hand. Whereas if he has nine, two, nine, three, nine, four, those are the ones which he might actually fold. So I think queen 10 will actually perform quite a bit better than uh, queen nine in that situation. That's how, that's why I thought in game at least. So. Right. So you fold there. Um, Weinstein picks up the blinds and antis, which is huge for his stack. Obviously, you are still quite comfortable there. No stress, really. Uh, and we see uh, play develop here in the following hand. All right. There's some shout outs here. We have people watching from, from Iceland on Twitch. We have Houston, Texas in the house, North Carolina, Atlanta, um, Reunion Islands. I don't know where that is. That sounds amazing. We have, we have San Remo, Italy in the house. Patrick, you and I both probably have some memories of that place. I never went to San you Remo, actually. You never went? One of the stops I didn't go to now. Oh, man. I never went to Deauville, and I never went to San Remo. Those were the two stops I always avoided. There's, there's, a connect, there's a connection between San Remo and Iceland. If anyone knows the connection between EPT San Remo and Iceland, let me know in the chat. This is, this is an insider one, but please let me know in the chat. All right, here's a raise to 150K with six as you have nine, a queen nine, same hand, uh, in the big blind. Um, you decide to defend here, flop a queen, uh, run us through the hand. Yeah, so this guy's a chip leader. I imagine he's going to open extremely wide. I felt like post-flop wasn't the kind of guy who would put a lot of pressure on me. I thought he would want to play kind of small ball against me. Like you can see he's checking sixes here. He probably should just bet sixes, make me fold a hand like king eight or king seven or ace eight or whatever it may be. Um, but I thought he would play passive against me. So that's why I defended pre-flop. Um, on the turn here, I think I should probably bet, yeah, he's most likely got a showdown value hand. If he has something, let's say he has seven, eight offsuit, he's likely going to just bet the flop. So when he checks, I think he has a jack, pocket tens, ace ten, something which is going to call me pretty often. So uh, I go for a bet. Yeah, so you you bet hoping that he you know calls down with weaker showdown hands. Yeah, and uh, yeah, probably he'll fold this one. Um, but if he does fold a hand like pocket sixes, it's also fine for me as well. Because if I check, he's probably going to check two, and then he just gets to realize all of his equity, and maybe he hits a six on the river and wins a big pot against me, or whatever it may be. About my sunglasses, uh, you're correct. I don't ever wear sunglasses, but the lights are so bright on these final tables, and people don't realize how bright they are when you're sitting there, especially in the seat I was in. It's opposite behind the dealer. The light's really shining down. You can see on the guy next to me, the light beaming off him. It's quite uncomfortable a lot of the time. This guy raised me here on the turn, with pocket sixes. Um, not sure exactly about that. He doesn't really represent much. Maybe he thought he turned a set, like he thinks he has pocket. Like, I'm not I'm not being like ironic. Like he might actually think he had pocket fives rather than pocket sixes. It's a similar hand. He has two red sixes. It's a black five. I'm not sure. Um, but I'm not going to fold. It's a line which just doesn't make much sense to me. So does the king on the, on the river scare you then or does it make you more comfortable uh, given that he's more likely to check behind, which he does in this case? Uh, it's not a good river for me because if he is bluffing with like ace 10 or king 10 or king 9 or something like this, uh, he's going to improve. And if he, if he does have an air ball like 7, 8 offsuit or something, he's very likely to continue bluffing because um, he can represent the king. Like I don't have that much king x hands myself. I'm going to be all in with ace, king, free flop, king, queen as well, potentially. So I don't like the king at all, but I love it when he snap checks. I'm like, okay, this is very good news for me. 
For everyone just tuning in, uh, we're getting some questions about what we are watching. This is a $3,000 No Limit Hold'em event from the 2019 World Series of Poker. There were 671 total entries. The first prize is 380000 And Patrick Leonard is joining us today, and you can see on the screen, he is at this final table from last year at the WSOP when the world was still just the world and things weren't very complicated. So we are using this opportunity to break it all down and to get deep into it. Uh, also, uh, no one got my, got my connection between EPT San Remo and Iceland. The connection is that during EPT San Remo, about seven years ago, there was the huge volcanic eruption on Iceland and people got stuck in San Remo, couldn't travel home because of the volcanic eruption. That's the EPT San Remo little gimmick. I was stuck in San Remo. That's why I remember. All right, we have Joe, Daniel, Bruno, Graham, uh, and Mitch watching from uh, on YouTube. I appreciate you guys all chiming in. Please hit that like button or smash it, if some pe as some people like to say. Um, Dave Temple watching from Hull, England. He says, it's bloody freezing here. Well, Dave, good thing you're inside watching the show. Appreciate you tuning in. And for the people on Twitch, thank you so much for being with us. This is only the second time that we are live on Twitch after we had Jennifer Tilly on the show just last week on Thursday night. All right, back another hand. There's there's plenty of hands here that you're involved in. It's uh, the Canadian no let uh, opening with ace queen on the button. You are with ace seven uh, suited in the big blinds. I feel as though many beginning players sometimes overestimate the value of the smaller suited aces. However, uh, Patrick, please speak to the fact that they still do have a uh, good value if you can see the flop for a reasonable price. Yeah, I mean, this one is definitely a fascinating spot pre-flop, I think. I think I'm very... I think, well, first of all, suited aces do have so much value. Even if he has, say, pocket kings, pocket queens, like monster hands, I'm going to have good equity against them, 30%. If I had a hand like ace, deuce, offsuit, I would have went all in here because ace, deuce, offsuit doesn't play that well post-flop. But a hand like ace, seven just plays really well. I don't achieve much by going all in. If I go all in with ace, seven, he's going to call me with ace, 10. He's going to fold ace, six. Whereas if I go all in with ace, two, I can make him fold ace, three, ace, four, ace, five, ace, six, ace, seven. So I can make him fold a lot of hands. Um, but with a7, I think I want to kind of slow play free flop, trap him a little bit with a7 here. So in this case, you feel really good about your hand? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's going to bet everything on his flop for sure. It's a, it's just a board where he's going to bet if he has king 10, he's going to bet if he has pocket fours. Um, I'm dying for him to check back at this point. I want him to check back and then I can basically bet the river and try to uh, get some value. I really don't want to face free streets of aggression here. I think my kicker is also pretty good. My seven, I don't block any clubs. I don't block any spades. No nine, no 10, no queen, no king in my hand. So a seven is probably the one ace that I really want to call down here because if he's going to bluff, he's probably going to bluff with some kind of equity. So either a straight draw, a flush draw. Um, he probably isn't going to just keep bluffing if he has a hand like seven, six of hearts, right? So... My seven is a really good kicker for me to have here. But he has a hand which for sure should go for free streets of value. So analyze this from his perspective. He's thinking, oh, Patrick's range is going to have a lot of smaller aces, so I'm going to go for three streets of value? Well, not a, he probably doesn't expect me to have that much ace X because he's going to expect me to go all in free flop a lot. Um, however, uh, he bets 400k here, which is a very, very interesting bet size because... I have 1.3 million now. If I call here and lose, I'm going to be the second shorter stack. If I just fold, I have a good 25, 22 big blinds, lots of fold equity in the future. It's a very interesting spot, I think. He basically knows he has lots and lots of bluffs here. So with Ace-Queen, he just thinks and assumes he has the nuts, which he rightfully does. Um, he's he's dying for me to continue. I just can't fold A7. It's just too, too strong of a hand. Oh, yeah, it's a good river card. It's a good river card. So I'm you now <laughs> I'm now living life. But then I'm also thinking, yeah, I mean, if he goes all in, I have to call, of course, because I beat value hands. He will have ace three, ace eight. He would open jack eight pre-blob. He can still shove a hand like ace king. He can have bluffs as well. But also lots of stuff did get did get there, right? Like nine ten spades. He's gonna have so many flushes. Queen two of spades, king two of spades. Uh, 10 four of spades whatever it may be so it's not like i have the stone cold nuts but i'm gonna have to go for it at this point if he goes all in so let's reason yeah. through this hand if the river is a non-seven card like is it is it you know is it pretty clear uh what your action is going to be if he bets again or is it very much dependent on the river card depends on the river card if the river cards are blank then i would always he checks here which is quite an interesting check 
think we probably will know that on this kind of river, I'm not going to make too many hero calls. So, like, let's say I have a hand like Ace Six or Ace Five or something like this. He probably knows I'm not going to call very often when the flush gets in. So he doesn't value jam as ace queen because he doesn't think I'm going to call with worse. And I have lots of hands which are better, lots of flushes, lots of random two pairs. So, um, so yeah, on most river cards, I would just fold my hand though because either a flush is going to come in or a straight's going to come in. And if a flush does come in, I don't have a flush card in my hand. Like I don't have the seven of spades. Uh, let's say the five of spades came on the river, it would be better to call about a seven with the seven of spades than a seven of hearts. So. I would let it go if a flush comes in, basically. And if a flush doesn't come in, I would probably end up calling my hand on most rivers. Pretty big river card for you, uh, Nolette and Gonzalez, still the chip leaders with over 4 million chips. You are now in third place with 2.2 million, creating a nice bit of separation between you and the guys that are shorter. Um, please talk to me about how this changes your approach to a final table when you get an increase in chips and you sort of separate yourself from the smaller stacks changes so much so uh when there's like five or six people left you can't really fold your way out because you're going to fold your way to fifth usually very often whereas now i have a bit of breathing room uh my tournament kind of focus is on stack uh preserv preservation rather than accumulation so with two million i'm still very far off being chip leader so i don't i'm not trying to accumulate the chip leader chips so i'm trying to preserve my two million basically so i want weinstein or weinstein and uh, D, B, uh, D, Debo, I think it's called, and also Ivan uh, Dera. I want those guys to basically go out and then me play free-handed against the two chip leaders and try to get lucky kind of thing. That's kind of my focus uh, at this point because the pay jumps between uh, sixth and fifth are not going to be very big. But once you get to the top three, the pay jumps start becoming really uh, big. I think first place is 380 and sixth place is 80K. So getting to these top three places is crucial. So I'm trying to just stay around and, and get there, basically, while still trying to take spots if I get them. I'm not going to just fold everything, but um, at this point, I will be playing extremely, extremely tight. We have Nolette with the raise with the queen five. Daira moving all in with with pocket eights and Gonzalez looking at queen uh, ace queen suited in the big blind. Of course, this is one where stack sizes really come into play, especially because Nolette and Gonzalez are the two big stacks with Daira all in, and he's not even one of the shorter stacks. So I feel as though we have to give Daira credit for a pretty pretty narrow range here. Uh, he he actually should be very loose because he, the his risk reward is so big. He's going to make. 160. Remember, this, there's an important factor here is that the ante is quite large. It's big blind ante, I believe. So you, the ante is twice twice as large as a normal tournament because the big blind pays ante every time. So when when we're down to three-handed or four-handed, the ante is actually going to be really big that each, each player is putting in each time. So there's lots of dead money. And Nole is going to be opening extremely wide. He's going to be opening, like you see, queen five suited, right? So if even has any ace, he can profitably show here for sure. And getting one through is very crucial, right? Because he also doesn't want to blind down to 800k, 500k, 700k. Being able to get one shove through has made him go up to 1.6 million. He's increased his stack by 33%, which is absolutely massive. And now he can play a bit tighter. Now he can wait for his spots. But getting that one through is so crucial when you're uh, jumped, uh, bunched together with other stack sizes. Because my reasoning was, and that's the reason why I thought it was going to be a tighter shove, is because uh, De Bernardi and Weinstein are so much shorter than him that like, the risk of him uh, going up against the chip leader, um, you know, from my perspective, would not be worth it given that those guys uh, basically have 10 bigs each. Yeah, and now uh, we call it the gap. So if you think the gap between someone's raised range and raised call range is too large, like if, let's say someone's opening 100% of hands and calling 5% of them, the gap is massive, right? So you would always shove any two cards. Whereas if someone opens 20% and calls 10% of hands, then the gap is not so small. So if you can kind of visualize all the hands in poker, see how many he's opening himself and then visualize how many he's calling, depending on the gap is depending on how risky you can be. Because if I tell you the guy's never going to call, you would just shove with seven deuce, right? Whereas if I tell you the guy's always going to call, you would shove very tight. So it's you, you, you trying to work out how big this gap is. Is it a hundred percent and zero? Is it a hundred and a hundred, or where is the gap? So uh, if you believe the gap is big enough, you can uh, add thirty-three percent to your stack. You just have to take those kind of spots. 
Here we have an all-in, Queens versus King Queen, Weinstein at risk against De Bernardi. Kind of interesting them both being the shortest stacks uh, going up against each other, which, you know, in many ways is the logical outcome, but you don't see it all that often that the smallest stacks clash and Queens, of course, here uh, with a massive lead. Uh, going back while we watch this all-in uh, to a question on Twitch from Triple G, he says, um, back to the A7 hand for the people that missed that, uh, Patrick River to two pair against Ace Queen. Um, he says, um, if, if you were last in chips, um, uh, without so much pressure from ICM, would A7 be a reshop in the big blind versus the button? So there's an important factor in this hand. It was uh, the small blind Weinstein here. Uh, he had six big blinds, I believe, or five between five, six to seven big blinds. So the button is actually probably not going to open that wide here because he's committing to calling off the short stack and the short stack had to gamble because he was so short. So... The button raise should actually be somewhat strong. And when I say strong, I don't mean like ace king. I mean, he's like, you know, queen tens, jack nines, stuff like this. It's not like he's going to just open the button with, say, jack two or jack three. If the small blind had the same stack size as me and we both had pressure on us, I would then be more inclined to be aggressive. Um, but yeah, if that was a very short stack, then I would, of course, just go and take my equity and run it against, say, queen ten off or whatever it may be. Shout out to the people in the chat. Stephen Grady asking a question on YouTube um, about the same hand because uh, as we saw, and I can pause this for a second while we tackle this hand uh, with one last question. Um, he's asking, why did you find the check back so interesting from uh, the ace queen there from Nolet on the river? Yeah, so his hand is just very strong, right? Like the board was ace, two, five, jack or something. It's like, it was a very dry kind of board. Um, He's not beat by many hands. So any pocket pair, I'm all in free flop. If I pocket freeze, I'm all in. Pocket eights, I'm all in. Pocket jacks, I'm all in. Pocket aces is unlikely because he has an ace. Um, ace jack is the top two pair, which improved. I'm all in with that. Um, I may shove the turn with some hands. So if, let's say I have a hand like ace three on the turn, which is two pair. I'm very likely going to be all in on the turn. There were so many draws out there that I would just go run my hand, get called by ace, queen, ace, king, fold out the draws, kind of add this huge part to my stack. So it's not like I have that many really strong hands. When I get to the river, I have lots of like one pair hands, ace sevens, ace sixes, ace fives. Um, so yeah, his hand is just very strong against against the range of hands I get to the river with, I think. We've gotten some new followers here on Twitch. Um, Jose... In a sort, we have Gutshot Vodka, we have uh, Wannabe, we have Bobby King, we have New Paranoid, we have a lot of people coming in on Twitch. Appreciate it. Only the second time we're live on Twitch, and I appreciate all the new followers on there, um, as well as my fans up on YouTube, which is the OG platform. Please don't forget to smash that like button and let me know where you're watching from, and that goes for every single platform. We have some Italian chatter going on on Facebook, which I also appreciate, and Ali Marchington says 2019 was a good year, and she says good evening, Pats and Remco. Appreciate you watching, Ali, as always. Please chime in the chat if you enjoyed the content. And this is Run It Back. So if you're new to the show, we are breaking down a final table from the 2019 World Series of Poker. If you're wondering, but Remco, you always watch High Stakes Poker. What is going on? Well, we're doing that again on Thursday night, uh, the 8 p.m. Eastern Eastern time time window. We're going to watch back to back high stakes poker episodes from season seven. And we're doing that in anticipation of high stakes poker season eight premiering on December 16th at 8, 8 p.m. Eastern time. And use the promo code HSP to take $20 off the annual subscription to watch the new season of high stakes poker as well as poker after dark and every single thing we've ever made. So that includes this final table. You can watch the whole six hour stream if you want to and send pads more questions about it because I'm sure there's plenty. All right, pocket tens on the button. Let's break this. This is, a really, this is a really interesting hand, actually. Yeah. yeah. So this is a spot where I'm going to be very aggressive pre-flop. There's two stacks who are shorter than me. I won't have many opportunities to raise myself because the two ship leaders on my right. So it's very rare that I even get a chance to open the button. So I am going to be very wide here opening. Uh, I'm going to think about my raise size. Again, the ante is really large. So the big blind gets a good price to defend lots of hands if I min raise. So I hope I go for a slightly larger size than 160. I hope I go like 220 or something, 215. Let's I'm not hope. sure what I go. Let's see what you do. That's what I would do now looking back at least. I don't know what the chips are. Yeah, I go 220, which I think is is good. Um, big blind with King Jack's quite close. He, I think he should probably go all in. Um, against me, I'm going to be extremely wide here. Uh, again, the gap between me. I also can't call wide, right? If he shoves all in, I can't just call with ace-eight or ace-nine or ace-seven because it's, he's basically covering me as well. So 
he can put a lot of pressure on me by rejamming here. So I think going all in as him would be pretty good. Uh, maybe he thinks he has big edge on me post flop and wants to take me to the streets though, which is uh, fair enough as well. Um, yeah, do, do you think the stacks uh, from his perspective are deep enough to see a flop or would you have preferred seeing a shove from him? I would shove with his hand, but it's of course going to be profitable to also call. I just think shoving makes more money. Um, yeah, very interesting flop for sure. Um, this is a board where I'm going to want to have a lot. He's going to have lots of check shoves here. So let's say he has a hand like Queen Jack. He's going to shove when I bet very often. Maybe you want to stop it just because it's. it may seem quite surprising that I check back such a strong hand on the flop. But on 10-9 deuce, let's say, if I bet the flop, he's going to shove with lots of hands like 7-8 of hearts. Let's just say he has king-5 of hearts. He's probably going to go all in. If he has any ace-x of hearts, he's probably going to go all in. So it's a board where of a shallow stack size, shallow-ish stack size, like 20 big blinds, I probably want to play quite passive with, say, ace-king, ace-queen, ace-jack. If I have a nine, let's say queen-nine, I'm probably going to want to check as well. So when I have so many kind of weak-ish hands that I want to check back, if I only check back my weak hands, my opponent gets to just be very aggressive on turns and put me into really tough uh, spots. So I need to check back some strong hands, but if I had aces, I want him to shove his draws. If I have kings, I want him to shove his draws. I want him to shove top pair, right? So if I have queens... I, if he has jack 10, I want to stack him. So when I block all the top pairs, he's more likely going to have something a bit weaker, which I don't mind him catching up with. So I decided to check back my kind of top set here, which may seem surprising for people saying, oh, well, the board's very drawy, but it's more that I'm thinking about all the hands in my range rather than just, okay, I have pocket 10s right now kind of thing. So how different would the situation be if you had jacks on that same flop? Yeah, hundred. I'm I'm always betting jacks, queens, kings, aces, pocket nines because I unblock the top. Mo the first hands he's going to check shove with are probably going to be top pairs, so ten x. So if I have jacks, it's really crucial for me to just make sure I stack him because let's say the turns an ace. Let's say I have jacks and he has uh, queen ten. If it turns an ace, he can get away from his hand, which is a disaster for me. So yeah, if I have jacks, it's very crucial to try to just pump in all the money now, kind of thing. Does does how you view your opponents as far as who's left in the tournament from a skill perspective factor into decisions like this? Or is this more so just basically uh, figuring out ranges and, and bet sizes? Um, yeah, of course. If, if there's an opponent who's like either always calling or always folding, you can use kind of in, inelastic sizes against them. So inelastic means essentially he will always call or he'll always fold. So whenever I bluff, I'll just min bet. Whenever I have a good hand, I'll just bet pot. But these players are all very strong players. Or I, I believe they're all professionals. This guy, I believe, probably like a live cash game guy by his mannerisms. He's He looks like he's like a live player. He's very good posture, et cetera. You know, he just seems like he plays a little bit poker. Um, so against this kind of player, I was just giving him like as much respect kind of thing. A uh, question coming in from Frisserup on Twitch. He says, how do you rank the players at the final table that are that are still remaining? So Noel T, uh, Noel A, he is one of the best players in the world, high stakes, Krisha. Um, so he's very good. Even Daira on my left is an extremely good player too, French player. Uh, Gonzalez I hadn't played against before. I don't know him. Uh, he seemed to play good. Uh, and, and Debo, like I said, I don't know him or know what he does or what he plays, but he looks like he plays poker kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? He looks like he, he looks like he's played lots of flops, lots of turns, lots of rivers. So I just imagine he's like an American live uh, cash game player. You know, like maybe he lives in LA, plays five ten or something. That's how I would assume him uh, from the outset. Uh, continuing here with the action in the hand, uh, he decides to lead on the turn, betting 290k, uh, and that takes us to the river as you make a call. Um, I'm I'm just guessing that there's not a lot of merit to raising here, um, whatever, basically. I, I thought the dealer was Charlie Carroll there. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm just, just going to call here. I think he's going to have lots of hands like Jack-5 suited, Queen-7, all these kind of hands. I want him to follow through on the river and bluff all in. If he does have a hand which is really strong, like two pair, I'm going to stack him very often anyway, I think. Um, he also doesn't have any sets. Like he, It's not like I have him set over set because pocket eights, pocket nines are going to be all in free flop. So I don't need to worry too much about those kind of hands. Uh, I'm just trying to maximize his bluff, his bluff frequency against me, essentially. Terrible river card, obviously. 7x gets there, queen x gets there. I'm just happy to kind of show down, hopefully. 
dying for him to check. I'm like, please don't go all in. And and that's the funny thing about how live tournaments sometimes play out is that if a few hands break right, then all of a sudden you have a chance to win a bracelet. If a few hands break wrong, you're out in fifth place and you win like 90k and you'll end up thinking about this for many years after. For sure, yeah. I would you would have huge regrets uh, afterwards, but I think like yeah, uh, once you get to a certain level of competency, you probably are less critical on, of yourself. I think, but if you're kind of guessing more in game then it's very easy to just say, oh, I wish I did this, or I wish I did that. Like I still have regrets from like, you know, 2012 in a 50 pound tournament in Newcastle casinos where I played certain hands band. I, I'm haunted by hands for sure <laughs> from from all, all stages of my career. I, I feel as though that is the only way to really get better is to be the person who is still haunted by their old mistakes because that will only uh, that, that'll be one of the one of the best ways to push you forward. Um, Olger on Facebook says, "Hello from New York City. I'm all in." Well, Olger, I call. Show me your cards. What do you got? All right, Rinchen is watching from Mongolia. Muhammad is with us from Indonesia. Once again, this show, the most international show in all of Floku. Jonathan says, please stop talking and let play. Well, Jonathan, go to PokerGo.com right now, and we will forever stop talking, and you can watch all the poker you want without this. This is a commentary show, so we are breaking down some of this old-school throwback footage, and we appreciate everyone with us in the chat. All right, De Bernardi with the Kings. Obviously, always a good moment if you wake up with the Kings. He made a small race from the from the small blind and Gonzalez call it from the big blind uh, defending and, and blind bat battles when you are at a final table especially when you're playing five-handed that to me as, as someone I would say I'm an intermediate beginner from this perspective that to me is always so tricky because I'm always like what's really what, what's really my benefit from risking chips here when ranges are harder to, do, to define in a blind battle like this so can you give us some pointers on on how to approach a situation like that from Gonzalez's perspective so Gonzalez doesn't have much pressure on him anyway. So the biggest risk which happens is he loses 1.1 million and he still has 2.5 million, which is a really good stack size. He's in position. He gets really good pot odds. His hand like 9-7 is just going to play so well. He gets to see what his opponent does on the flop. I actually think the the check from Debo on the flop is very suspicious, right? The board is 6-deuce-deuce. Which hands would you want to check on 6-deuce-deuce? You're going to bet pocket sevens. You're going to bet ace king. You're going to bet when you miss, when you have nine eight or when you have jack ten. So it's very bizarre that he checked. If I was Gonzalez, I'd definitely be having kind of signals coming up like, why is this guy checking this board? It doesn't make sense to check anything unless you're trapping. Do you know what I mean? So Debo gets a very bad run out for him, though. Gonzalez is going to be forced to bluff here. He's going to call the turn with lots of hands like king of diamonds, nine, queen of diamonds, jack. So. On the river, he's going to have so many flushes. I don't think Debo... If Debo can somehow find a call here, he needs to expect Gonzalez to turn a six into a bluff, like six five suited or a six off suit or something like this. And I think with a six, he would most likely take his showdown. So it's going to be a tough goal for Debo. You can see he's frustrated. He's like, why didn't I bet the flop? And um, and and this and this goal plays into what you said earlier about you know gauging whether someone is is an accomplished or an experienced player because I don't think you'd be as likely to make a bluff against someone who is purely recreational mostly looking at their own cards being like I have kings I'm not going anywhere yeah exactly he has to expect him to well with 9-7 he's trying to make Debo fold his bluffs as well so let's say Debo had a hand like queen jack of clubs and just put a bet out on the turn you're trying to bet the turn to make him fold his worst air kind of thing as well. So you can use a kind of small size in, but yeah, I would never use a large size in to make somebody fold a top pair hand if they were an amateur player, because generally they're not going to want to do that. Does the fact that De Bernardi um, thinks here for a long time with Kings, does that make you feel, um, th does that speak well of his game? The fact that he realizes these things or does it, does it more so show you that he made a big mistake on the flop? I wouldn't say it's a huge mistake on the flop. I would say, I'd say, yeah, of course, it, he's a, he considers every spot quite deeply. I think there's actually interesting kind of the interaction between the guys just a little, little bit ago where they were, uh, Gonzalez was really staring him down, trying to, uh, and now he's looking away, which I think is somewhat suspicious that he changes his motion and his, his posture and everything kind of in game. I think that's kind of, that's something which maybe Debo could have read on, but maybe he thinks it's it's strong. Who knows? Right. Uh, Darren Wagner on Facebook is saying, um, why did you take your glasses off on the river? Were you trying to intimidate him in the hand with 10s where you checked behind? 
Um, no, so uh, I, I I was I was looking at the board. Uh, I just took my took my glasses off to see what the guy had because looking across the table, you know, the cards and it's not four color deck or anything like this. It's just two color deck. It's actually quite hard to see sometimes. So the board is like eight, nine, ten jack, and he had king jack. So you want to see is it is it queen jack? Is it king jack? Is it king queen or whatever? So I was just trying to um, to see. This is actually pretty interesting. I check back. I'm too deep to go all in. I don't just go all in to like 40 big blinds or 35 big blinds. It's nice to have an ace as well when I check because if an ace comes out, the small blind's going to stop putting huge barrels in. So having an ace is, is quite nice for me. Yeah, so in this, in this case, you're up against who you deem to be the best player at the table. Uh, as far as stack sizes go, Daira and DiBernardi still shorter than you. The reason I'm mentioning it for everybody watching, those things are big considerations when it comes to how a hand like this plays out. So um, no let. Um, he, he bets here on the flop. Um, walk us through what you're thinking right now. Um, yeah, so he's just going to bet. He's going to bet from the small blind very often uh, when he's the chip leader. Just I'm forced to fold hands, which I would call in the cash game. So like... I would call certain hands in a cash game where, because I need to preserve my stack, I'm going to fold in a tournament. So he can bet out a lot and I'm forced to fold a lot. But when he bets here and I call, um, I think he's going to play turns pretty passively. So if he just has nothing, I don't expect him to bet again because if I have a jack, I'm not going to fold. If I have a 10, I'm not going to fold. If I have a queen, I'm not going to fold. So you, get, you, you expect to see lots of aggression on the flop, but then lots of uh, checking on the turn, which, which he's also going to do with hands like pocket sevens or a 10 or ace king, whatever it may be. There's no reason for me to bet. No, I don't make any better hands fold. Interesting river card. It is an interesting river card. Um, it doesn't really make sense for him to do too much betting. If he had king queen, he's going to bet the turn. If he had uh, clubs, he's going to bet the turn very often. So maybe he has some kind of ace, but even with an ace, he may check the river as well. So if you bet the river, I'd be very suspicious. Um, Obviously, I'm going to value bet now. I can have a hand like 9-8, queen 9, queen 8, 7-8, lots of potential bluffs. I can turn a hand like a 4 into a bluff, potentially. So definitely going to value bet my hand here. Um, let's play a little game here with the people in the chat. Let, let us know in the chat right now, in this moment, how much do you think Patrick should bet here? There's 400k in the pot. Let's play this little game here and see um, what Patrick bet here. So while you guys think here, give you guys a few seconds. Let me know in the chat, 400k in the middle. He's going to go for value here with two pair. Let us know in the chat how much you think he should be betting. And Patrick will give you some, some time as well to sort of rethink that and, and give us the sizing that you would like to see right now. Um, I'm just looking at the uh, chat here. Uh, ben says the screen is too small to watch full screen bigger monitor those are all options I hope you can follow the action I appreciate you watching um, Salim also watching appreciate you as well Seth Weintraub coming in with the first guess here all right we're seeing tons of amounts coming in I love I love to see this um, and Sebi says what a clutch run out I mean that is how you win tournaments by hitting clutch runouts all right we're getting tons of reactions in the chat of course I can't tackle them all we're live on three platforms but you can then tell your you can pat yourself on the back if the number that you're saying is the same number that comes out of Patrick's mouth and then we'll compare it to what you actually ended up doing so Patrick what do you what do you want to see from yourself here um, I would like to use a large size. And uh, I think in general, I don't, I don't have many thin value bets here. So like, let's say I have a hand, if I have a Jack, I'm going to bet the turn, right? So if I have a hand such as 10, nine or ping 10, I'm not going to bet the river. I'm happy to show down, try to take the 400,000. So on the river here, I'm, I'm literally betting flushes, straights and ace X. I don't have that much ace X. Like I'm going to raise ace queen, ace jack free flop. I'm going to raise ace nine free flop. I'm going to probably raise ace eight free flop, ace three, ace four. These are two pairs. So, you know, I have a few like ace two and ace five. But mostly the hands I'm going to bet are going to be like 10 X of clubs, which is a flush, king queen, which is a straight, ace four, which is two pair, uh, king five of clubs, which is a flush. So I'm not betting thinly for value. So I'd like to use a more larger size in here. Um, so yeah, I hope I go somewhere like over 200,000 for sure. A lot of the time you see people betting third part and it's a big mistake on the river in position, um, because you can just check and, uh, not have a thin value bet. But I think that I probably went too small looking back. I don't know. I don't know what, how many chips are in my hand, but it feels like there's not many chips in that hand for sure. So let, let, the amount that you're hoping to see is what, 250? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, over, over half pots. Anywhere between 200K and 300K, I would like to see. But I, I, I believe I, I may have went like 175 or something silly. 
Sorry if anyone suggested that amount. I know, it seems like I may have went a bit bigger. He throws the chip at you to indicate the call immediately. Uh, you made it 315K. No, yeah. my, my chip flew into his stack size, actually. Oh, okay, okay. So that wasn't his call. So three, no. 315K, that is the amount you bet. So it's, it's more than 200, which is good, but it's also maybe a little bit too big is what you're saying. No, this is, I, I would I would like to go, uh, if, if I had the spot again, I would go probably this, this amount, anywhere between 300 and 350 for sure. Um, but yeah, anything over 200 is fine. Anything under 200 would be a big mistake, I think. What was the most common uh, size from the chat? Um, let's see, we have, um, well, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rip off a few just so we can get through this. Uh, uh, 300, 190, 280, 335, 220, 260, 350, 275, um, 92, 150% of pot. Um, and then on Facebook we have, oh, I love this, Bruce Walker, 625K. I, I think that's good. I honestly think that's good. Honestly, I think that's really good. All right, Bruce, I'll, hit you, I'll, get you, I'll give you a like for that comment. That's awesome. Um, yeah, 250K, 220, 170, 160, 320. And then on Twitch, we have 350. We have a, a few people saying overbet, um, uh, 400, 400, 160, 300, 325. Yeah. Um, f I, of course, I just rattle off a bunch of numbers, which is highly confusing for anyone watching and wondering what the hell is going on. When I rattle off those numbers, is there anything, any takeaway from that? Do, do you notice anything in that pattern of, of those numbers? Are people generally in the right range or are they too small or too large? No, they seem to be in the right range, about 350, right? So yeah, <laughs> seemed, uh, seemed good. Come on, people. No one made the joke 350. What, what, are, we, what are we doing here, really? Come on. I think I heard someone make it, actually. Maybe they, maybe they just said the numbers, yeah. Yeah, that doesn't count. You have to say about 350. That's the only way it counts. Um, all right, moving into the next hand. Um, Good question from Frister up on Twitch. He says, do you change your game plan when the whole cards are exposed 30 minutes later on a live stream um, final table? No, no. I'm just going to the player what I think is good kind of thing. Um, no. Obviously, if I make a play against somebody and I've bluffed him and he knows I've bluffed him, then maybe that'll make me change my frequencies in the future. But unless something absolutely crazy goes down or I see a guy open and seven years off or something, I would just try to play it in line because they also have the information too, right? Like if they know they've raised seven two, they're probably not going to raise it next time because it's it's been it's shown down. So it's easy to level yourself like this. Uh, this is a really really interesting spot. So I raise the cutoff, and the small blind goes all in for eleven big blinds, and he's by far the shortest stack, and he's probably going to shove ace two suited, king queens stuff like that. You can see I really don't like it. So very, very, very close to the sound. Like ace 10 is a super, super snap call. And like a seven is a, is a snap fold. So ace nine really is in the uncomfortable territory here. What, what about, um, just to throw a few out there, what about king queen suited? I would snap call, yeah. Again, it's about domination. So like my nine doesn't do too much for me. He's probably not shoving nine eight. He's probably not shoving 10 nine. He's probably not shoving jack nine. But when I have king queen, he has king jack, king 10, queen 10, queen jack you know, queen nine suit, whatever it may be. So um, yeah, I think king queen probably does slightly better than ace nine off here, especially as he may not shove like ace deuce off himself. Um, I'm trying to get some kind of a read. Like I'm mostly, I, I, I'm seen as an online player, but I definitely prefer, I think I'm a lot stronger live than online. Um, so I'm a lot about trying to get reads and feelings and energy and intuition through, uh, through asking questions or looking at people or, speaking out loud, whatever it may be. So it's definitely what I'll be doing in most of the spots. Um, and how, so yeah. how, how strong are our sixes, sevens and eights? For me, I would for sure call them. Yeah. Right. Because he's got the, the first like hands he's going to shove is like ace, 10 offsuit, ace, jack offsuit, ace, queen offsuit, ace, king offsuit. There's so many combinations of offsuit combos there. So when I have sixes, I'm just flipping enough of the time. Um, but yeah, I made, I'm, I'm happy I made this fold. Uh, it's a tough fold, I think, because he's a short stack. I'm getting a very good price. I dominate some hands. Uh, but yeah, he seemed he seemed pretty calm, I thought. I don't know. Let's see what else we got going on here. Poker Weather on Twitch says, oh no, you're making Paz watch his jack, Jack's fold again? Yes, we are. 
we are we are getting to that in just a second and, and Patrick did a breakdown of that hand on his YouTube channel so go find him if you just search Patrick Leonard on YouTube you will find his channel please like and subscribe and, and check out his videos as well uh, but not before uh, liking and subscribing to our channel because we do the show twice a week and we're here to bring you both entertainment and a little bit of education every now and then and that is what we're here for today if you're just tuning in this is Run It Back we are breaking down a final table from the 2019 World Series of Poker. All these final tables and all this action that we're watching on Run It Back is available on Poker Go. So if you're tired of us talking, which I can I can understand that, you can go to PokerGo.com right now. And if you're not a subscriber just yet, use the promo code HSP to take $20 off the annual subscription. And please know that we have a new season of Poker After Dark starting on Sunday and a new season of High Stakes Poker starting on December 16th with new episodes airing every single week. So I don't, I don't, know, I don't know what else to say. That's just going to be uh, a great little bit there for you guys to enjoy all right what's uh, what's happening here he limped a small blind and i check the big blind with uh jack 10 it's a hand which i don't really want to raise it doesn't do much for me by raising he doesn't fold queen jack he doesn't call you know jack six or anything so it's a hand which i'm really content to just check with on the flop uh He's probably not going to fold a better hand. He's probably not folding ace high yet. He's not going to fold a seven and a to king. I'd rather just check and see what happens. Turn a 10 and uh, it's kind of an interesting turn card. His hand is so bad. He has no heart in it. He should just check fold the 10 here. Uh, he seems kind of disinterested in the pot. You can kind of you can kind of assume that he doesn't seem too interested. I, I want to check back and then bluff catch most rivers because if he has a hand himself like I don't know, four or five offsuit, he's always going to bluff the river once it checks down. So I have a hand which really enjoys checking to the river, then bluff catching. Um, I think he might check again. It's interesting that he's not looking at me at all or trying to get a read on. I'm really looking over towards him, but his game is more trying to do the opposite, I guess. So it's interesting when you have two people who are like, I really like it when both people are looking at, looking at each other. Um, when someone doesn't look at you, you can often... You don't be, you can't get those reads on players. Like if I'm playing against Daniel Negreanu, I definitely would not be trying to stare him down or trying to do anything like that for sure. But yeah, it's uh it's an interesting one for sure of how you should approach those spots. I think this guy, uh Nolte Nole, he has really good live presence. He is he's seen as a bit of a psycho, like very aggressive, very crazy. And he understands his image very well. He's he's honestly I I consider him one of the elite elite players online and live. Um, I definitely would have preferred him to bubble the final table, that's for sure. <laughs> but lucky me, I've got position on him, so that's nice. Definitely. Uh, for people who are just tuning in, this is the 3K No Limit Hold'em final table with 380K up top. Pads and myself are breaking it all down for you. Daniel Riley on YouTube says, always listening to the way Patrick thinks about hands appreciate that and Sevi follows it up with always giving great breakdowns so that is a good one to, to put into your, into your pocket uh anchor matsi on twitch says what is this well i just explained it to you we are doing a live watch uh, party of this final table from the 2019 uh, wsop um interesting topic you brought up there um patrick about more experienced live players and staring them down or not staring them down in the case of someone like Daniel Negreanu. Is there something such as, you know, a live presence or a live aura that intimidates even someone at your level? Like if you're staring down Stephen Chitwick, you feel as though he's looking right through you uh, versus, you know, of course, a more inexperienced player? For sure, for sure. Um, especially like earlier in my career, like maybe a year ago, two years ago, where I wasn't too confident. Um in in certain things then yeah for sure um there's players yeah there's players that, especially if they've made like a big call against you or like an exploitative call like let's say you bet the river and they call the hand which you would never call with then you start questioning like did you see this or do they see that um so yeah i mean i just tried like, you can see that when i'm in pots against these guys i'm not trying i just try to be quite you know i'm, I'm relatively covered up i'm just sitting kind of still like i'm if they're if it's on if it's their turn, I'm trying to not look at them. If it's uh, so, I just yeah, I try to just not give away too much. I guess like you can see that I'm not trying to have eye contact when it's his turn, so he can get a read on me. I think he may even look over to me. This guy is a very good live player as well. Uh, he considers lots of good things, so you can see that once he starts betting, I'm now looking at him. Do you see the difference where where he's thinking? I'm trying to like not look at him but when i know he's going to bet i'm then starting to try to get the reads and the tells if that makes sense um but yeah good flop for me obviously flopping top pair 
uh, I'm not going to enjoy facing multiple streets of aggression because he raised under the gun. He's not going to bet that better hand like pocket queens. So by the river, if he does keep betting, my hand is going to turn from a very, very good hand to just a pure blood catcher. So that's on my mind. Um, very bad turn card. Ace queen gets the pocket jacks gets the queen nine suited gets there. I do improve my equity in terms of either straight draw now, but if he was bluffing on the flop with say ace queen or queen nine or pocket jacks, he was betting for that for whatever reason, he's improved. So could be dangerous. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, there's, there, there's just a lot of combinations here that probably connect with that turn. Um, it goes check, check though. Um, you must be actually, this is another opportunity here. Uh, for the people in the chat, as we break down this hand, please let us know what would you do in this position right now? Uh, Patrick is in the big blind against the under the gun raise from Daira, who is a strong live player. Look at the cards, look at the board, look at the stack sizes and let me know. Are you betting, checking? How much are you betting? Are you just open folding because you're scared? Just let us know what you're, what you're thinking of doing um, in the chat. I think it was a fun game. And I think we got quite a lot of responses to that just before. So 960k in the middle. We have top pair. We are up against a player who we consider to be very strong. Stack sizes are somewhat similar with a short, shorter stack still at the table here. Um, people, get your guesses in right now. And then Patrick will break it down for you. And while you're at it, please smash that like button if you enjoy the content. I see we have some new followers on Twitch. I appreciate it. We have Congius. We have uh, Dakinovic. We have Frisser up. Unibet, po hey, Unibet Poker. My old friends from Unibet. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it. I uh, worked for Unibet for quite a, quite a few years. Uh, Playmaker562, we have Brian Kurth, we have RHCP, I love the peppers myself as well. Gumball3000, we have um, Bad Cards AA, well, those are quite good cards, also following us. Edgy Dots, joining us on Twitch, so for, hit that follow button on Twitch if you enjoy the content. All right, the comments are streaming in, which means that it's the time for us to break it down. So Patrick, uh, what would you like to see from yourself in this, in this spot? Well, before, before the size, and I think one of the most interesting things is like, what am I trying, when I'm bluffing, so like, first of all, I'm always working out what am I bluffing before what am I value betting, because your value bets are very easy to work out, right? So if I have two pair, I'm obviously betting. If I have pink queen, I hope I'm going to bet. If I have a straight, I hope I'm going to bet. But I have to think about what am I bluffing, right? So if I have lots and lots of bluffs, I want to choose a larger size. But if I don't have many bluffs, I may want to choose a smaller size. So Looking at the board here, it's it's tough to think of many bluffs, right? Like the only hands I could really potentially bluff is like 4x. So if I had like 5, 4 suited or ace, 4, I could bluff this hand to make maybe pocket 9s fold, pocket 8s fold. So I have to ask myself, okay, which hands am I bluffing with? And then which hands am I bluffing against? So am I trying to bluff him off pocket 9s or am I trying to bluff him off ace jack? Um, I think trying to bluff him off 10, 9 suited, 10, 8 suited, pocket 9s, six seven suited a six these kind of hands makes most sense so i think typically i want to go for a smaller size and uh, i don't have that many super strong value bets in terms of ace queen i'm going to be all in free flop tens jacks and kings i'm going to be all in free flop pocket fours i'm going to check raise the flop very frequently so i don't have that many value bets i have lots of quite finished value bets like king eight king nine king queen and then I'm bluffing like a four. So I would like to see myself go relatively small rather than bombing it. So somewhere around 30 to 40% out of the position here, I think is going to be okay. I think I may have went like 50 or 60 in game, um, but I think going smaller would be good. So the pot's 960. I would like myself to go, let's say 380K-ish. Right. So as far as from Dyrus' perspective and you calling a raise from the big blind, um, is that also what sort of complicates things because of, you know, your your range of hands that is weaker that would bet is, is fairly limited? Yeah, it's just tough. So, like, if I had an ace on the flop, the aces which I would call on the flop would be ace-jack and ace-queen if I didn't go in three flops, so they've improved. I'm not going to call the flop with ace-7 or ace-8. So it's hard for me to have many bluffs here. Like, uh, on king-10x, queen-jack's got there, queen-9's got there. So there's not many, it's hard to bluff here. So I'm probably thinking in my head, what, do, what am I bluffing here? Um, I'm very intrigued what size I went. Well, you throw it down there confidently. Let's see how much it is. I wanted to go 380, but is it like 400 ish? It's hard, it's hard to see. 390. Okay. I, I, I swear I haven't seen, but I mean, it's not, 
it's not that rare, right? Like this is what I'm thinking now. I'm probably thinking somewhat similar in game two. Like my thought process is probably quite consistent in right. spots. So, um, yeah. Um, appreciate uh, G on YouTube saying a uh, bet about 350. I'm, I'm happy that the Jokers are with us today. I appreciate that. Uh, Clay Wilson says 375. Um, Victor on Facebook says 350. I love that. Um, not too many people um, in the right range there. A lot of bigger, a lot of a lot of much bigger sizes are being mentioned in the chat. Um, but yeah, the reasoning that you gave is very interesting because those are things that we always have to consider. And with we, I mean just metaphorically speaking, we as the person in in the big blind there. Yeah. Again, I'm trying not to look at him too much. I, I wish I wasn't riffling my chips. To be honest, looking back, I wish I wouldn't do that. But yeah. Um, he folds, which is, it's just fine. So you think riffling the chips makes you look stronger? Not stronger, just like I could be given, I'm sure that I'm not 100% consistent. And I mean, this is a big spot. It's for a World Series poker bracelet. Like maybe I'm getting uh, flustered in some spots or maybe I look too comfortable in, too, in some spots, you know? Like I think trying to stay stoic and trying to stay just very still, not, not even still, just like not doing too much different things where people could get reads on you, I think is is quite, quite important uh, thing to do. Like, Riffling the chips, like I can riffle the chips now on my office table. Is I have the rest of my life to riffle the chips. This is not the spot where I should be riffling chips. I don't think. What, what do you think? Just I'm, a small thing. What do you think I'm, I'm doing just right now? I'm back critically myself, saying I wish I wouldn't do that. Here's a big hand. So here, here is a very big hand. Just as a joke on the side, I'm sh I'm shuffling chips right now. Um, all right, this is the big spot. This is the jacks uh, against the pocket fours. Um, yeah, walk, walk us through the thought process. I know you've already spent many hours on this hand, uh, but it is still very interesting for all of those who haven't seen this before. So by the way, if you're watching, pay attention now. Turn up the volume a little bit and, and, and get learned. So, so first of all is I have 35 big blinds uh, here. The null A has 40 big blinds. Someone else has 35. So we're kind of very bunched together. Someone has 15 and the other guy has 12. So the antis are very large. So it essentially means the 15 big blind stack has 13-ish. And it means the 12 big blind stack has like 10-ish, the way that the stacks become. Uh, the big blind here is really risking a lot of chips. He's risking 35 big blinds to win three and a half big blinds. It's not, it's, it's a very high risk reward, right? So... I assume that he wouldn't be shoving a hand like pocket fours or like pocket fives or like pocket eights or nines. I assumed he would shove ace king always, ace queen always, maybe a hand like ace five. Sure, that's the kind of hand I would expect him to bluff with, but to risk so many chips, I didn't expect him to have an underpair uh, ever, really. That was how I assumed in game. Um, so yeah, it's a very, there's lots of things to consider here for sure. I feel like at this point of the tournament, I have a very good position in the tournament. I have 32 big blinds left, which is a really good stack size. I feel like I have good reads on all the players. Uh, I think we've just missed a hand as well just before where Nole raises the button with ace-queen and I fold ace-nine suited in a small blind, um, which was like a really important part of the tournament where I should go bust like 10 out of 10 times. So... Because I didn't go bust there and I had a good read on him, I, I assumed. I don't mean like I have this stone read on the guy or whatever, but I had a good feeling about all three of the players. I thought all four of the players, I thought. I really thought that with 32 blink blinds, I have a very, very good edge left in the tournament. And pulling off jacks here is not going to be making much money. Um, if he is shoving ace king, ace queen, ace five, like let's say he's only shoving ace king, ace queen, ace five. Paul and Jacks here would lose me like $15,000, $20,000. It would be a very bad call to make. If he's shoving pocket nines, ace king, ace queen, and ace five, I would still be losing lots of money by calling. Uh, it only becomes a really bad fold once you start shoving all the underpairs, never shoves any of the overpairs kind, kind of thing. But in this spot, I thought, well, maybe he's shoving pocket queens. Maybe he's shoving pocket kings. Maybe he's shoving pocket aces. Maybe he's not sh like... Because it's 35 big blinds, maybe he doesn't have a non-all-in free bet range in these positions. The one thing which I didn't take into account as much as I should is what happens when I win? Because when I win, I go up to 7 million, I take out the best player, and I win the tournament, I would say, like 80% of the time. So the risk-reward is so interesting. When it goes bad, I, go, I finish the tournament last. When it goes really good, I usually win the tournament. But when I just fall, I think I come top two very often in the tournament. Um, Gonzalez is a really nice guy and he played great. But I feel like 
I've played 30 big blind poker for 10 years. Like I understand it pretty well. And I was like confident playing for the next two or three hours uh, for these kind of stack sizes with a great structure. So I believe that I finish top two very, very often in tournament when I fold. I believe when I call, I'm going to finish fifth very often. And I sometimes finish first. So there's lots of things to consider about the future game. Um, let me ask you. Yeah, let, me, let me ask you a silly, yeah. a silly question about this hand. If he shows you Ace King suited face up, do you make the call? No, it's not full. If he showed me Ace, if he showed me uh, on his hand, uh, if, he, if if he, if there's three hands in front of him, he showed me Ace King, Ace Queen, and Ace Five. I, I would still instantly fold. Wow. Um, even if he showed me Ace King, Ace Queen, Ace Five, and pocket nines, I would still be probably on the on the line of folding to you. Um, he shows me he shows me a four here. So when he shows me a four, I assume that he has ace four suited, right? So I'm like, okay, well, I'm still happy folding because if his range is ace king, ace queen, ace four, ace five, uh, pocket queens, you know, pocket kings, it's I still have to fold. So I'm actually like, okay, laughing. I don't mind kind of thing. I'm like, okay, probably a good fold. I don't know until like 30 minutes later that he had pocket fours, and I'm like, what? Um, I actually worked out on the video that I posted on this just a couple of days ago that. If he only ever has pocket falls, like this exact spot, so let's imagine his range doesn't matter. In this exact spot, if he has pocket falls, I lose $42,000 by folding. So my fold costs me $42,000. So uh, in my YouTube uh, comment section, I made everyone tell me what they would spend their $42,000 <laughs> on because I thought that was quite funny. I, and I look back with no regrets at all. Like I, I'm really okay with it. I think my folds are good folds. Uh, obviously, when he has pocket falls, it looks terrible. But I think I analyze the situation okay, and I don't mind folding. And if, if I went back now again, uh, I would probably fold. Obviously, if no one has pocket folds, I wouldn't. But I, I, I'm completely okay with uh, with folding. So it's okay. That is such an interesting hand. Uh, for the people in the chat, if you do have any good ideas how to spend $42,000, $42, please let us know, because that is quite an interesting little uh, thought process there. But yeah, uh, Crazy Fold, if you want to hear a more detailed breakdown of that specific hand, check out Patrick Glenn's YouTube page as well. He did an in-depth breakdown of that specific moment. All right, we have Daira with Queens all in. Nolet uh, picks up pocket nines, gives us a chance to look at the chat for just a second. Uh, Twitch chat going wild about this hand. I appreciate everyone uh, chiming in. Uh, Todd is, is really upset about staring in poker and how it has ruined the game. Uh, Todd, do you think that there was no staring back in the day? Um, I mean, people might have acted a bit faster, but staring was, was definitely a part of the game. Well, that's the thing, right? Like, you only stare at someone for a long time if they're taking a long time. So, like, if I'm playing against a professional, it takes two minutes. Should I just let him take two minutes and just, like, slow down for everyone kind of thing? If an amateur or a professional is taking 10, 15 seconds, it's not like you're staring them down, like, in intensively there you can see that often you don't start staring until like the last second when they're putting the chips in anyway because you're interested of what's happening so if someone's staring someone down for two minutes i wouldn't blame the guy staring i blame the guy who's taking two minutes to uh to, to make the decision because that definitely didn't happen in, in the past either yeah so we we more so have a um a timing issue uh versus a, a staring issue all right dyra all in here with queens against no let's nines here still five-handed in this 3k no limit hold'em event if you're new to the show this is running back we watch old school poker footage in this case 2019 final table from the wsop featuring the guest on the show today patrick leonard he has his own youtube channel he goes around the world travels plays poker does the high stakes thing um does a lot of cool stuff for party poker so please go check him out um, and if you have any questions if you enjoyed the show please let me know in the comments in the chat and you know follow like subscribe do all those good things we are live in three platforms so it's a little bit hard sometimes to keep up with everyone uh, however i will do my best to get as many questions in as possible here on the show um a lot of people saying i don't know if i spent be <laughs> i don't know if i'd be spending any time thinking about making the call with jacks yeah and that, that's probably why you're maybe not a pro maybe those are the moments that uh, turn you into a better player when you when you do sort of even though in this case you know he has fours and you were wrong but the fact that you can break a moment down in real time the way that you did i think that sort of goes to show that you sort of taken a step to the next level is, is that a fair assessment well, I mean, you know, like most people would, 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 even professionals would all say it's, it's not, most people wouldn't fold there. And even myself, you know, looking from the outside, I would also probably speculate also that it would be a bad fold, you know? So I wouldn't say this was like a pro fold or anything like this. I'm not trying to, 
to try to play that card at all. It's probably just, it, it, you know, potentially is a bad fold. The way that I perceive the Rangers to be, it would be a good fold. But if the Rangers are completely different, then it means just my perceptions and my analysis is very wrong, you know? So I think it just shows in poker that, you know, even if you are a professional, you'll still make lots and lots of, you know, really big mistakes as well. And a lot, a lot of life, I think, is about forgiving yourself everything you know like and if you don't forgive yourself of making a fold on a final table or making a bad play in poker then probably in in life it's going to be difficult to forgive yourself too you know i do i i play i play i don't know 100 bad hands every session i play when i say bad like i could have played the hand better i could use a different size and i could use a different combo choice whatever it may be so i'm always going to be every everyone is going to make bad plays every time they sit down and play poker so it's important not to uh to beat yourself up for sure this is an interesting one i don't remember this one so well so you come in for the raise with ace jack off gonzalez finds queens in the big blind and let me just also state by the way that i am on a level of play where i see jacks and i'm snap calling so i don't want to if if i make jokes about your level of play people in the chat just know that i'm making jokes about myself because i am definitely not on any high level i'm probably better at do seven triple draw than i am a no limit hold'em uh, and i don't know i don't even know if that's a good or a bad thing, but I do enjoy playing the mixed games. Um, Love Love Fee on Twitch says, slightly overthinking, but with five left in the WSOP, can't blame you. Um, this hand you said you don't remember all that well. Um, however, piecing it together now, seeing that Gonzalez put in the three bet, what are, you, what are your thoughts? So um, I, I hope, I, I, I assume that I fold. Um, it's, it's obviously a really strong hand, first and foremost. I mean, my image now is like the biggest nick of all time. It's Jack, I hope I fold. I open late position, he free bets the blinds. Like this hand should very often just go four bet all in. But, you know, um, again with Gonzalez, uh, I believed, you know, like I, I had quite strong reads that he wouldn't just go after me, you know, like is he really going to look down here at say ace five and just free bet me? Like he's in the big blind, he can just call. Like I believe his range is going to be very, very, very strong. It's also in my mind that I've just folded that really big hand previously and maybe they're going after me, but have to be confident that uh to just stick with stick with the with the game plan kind of thing and you did make the fold and we move on to the, to the next hand um just for the people um to put in perspective how long like we're, we're watching a condensed version of this final table we're about an hour into the show right now um how long did this take because it feels as though this five-handed battle went on forever yeah no one was busting uh no one was busting at all which was uh quite frustrating i guess it took like four hours Wow. three or four hours to get to like 400 um so yeah i mean it's it, it it's a slog you know things it's weird because you can't plan for it sometimes you could be down to heads up in in 45 minutes sometimes you could be playing 10 hours and still be like three or four hundred so you can't plan for it um and yeah you do this is an interesting hand as well um again like similar to before do you remember when i said the guy should probably go in with king jack against me on the button um, what I thought here was that Gonzalez is opening into myself and Nole, and we're both seen as very sticky, very aggressive, very, like, we want to play lots of pots. So I think Gonzalez will probably open quite tight into us, and I believe that also post-flop I'll play quite well and realize a lot of equity here. So um, I went for the call here. Um, great flop for me, obviously. Yeah, we go to the flop here. Jack does three, goes check check really quickly. You check again very quickly on the turn. Yeah, he snap checked the flop, which I thought was kind of weird. Yeah, um, check down to the ace river, which is not great, of course. So why did you? You can have an ace so often here. Why did you check the turn so fast? So I went for the check on the turn because I believe if he has a hand like uh, nines, ten, like basically when he checks the flop, he either has a pocket pair or an or an ace. So I believe that on Jack two three three, he's going to bet the turn very often. So if he has like sevens, he's going to bet the turn. Then I can get a raise in. Even if he has a hand like Ace Queen, I imagine him to bet the turn quite often. But what I kind of said free flop kind of probably should make me bet the turn because he's the kind of player who doesn't want to face. He's like thinks that these young American or these young European kids are going to like go after him. So he doesn't bet his Ace Queen because he thinks I'm going to try to bluff him or something. So I probably should have taken that into an account and bet the turn myself. He bets the river here. I hope. I mean, it's hard to fold here when we get to the river, but I, I hope I can put it together. I don't remember what. I think it may pay him off, but I, I, I hope I don't. I think these are spots that are important to find the fold. Again, I'm sunglasses are half trying to work it out, trying to. He's really staring me down, which is 
which <laughs> which was uh yeah i i'm try I'm, I'm i'm i think i'm laughing i think i started to laugh because he's really staring me down it's like he's trying to cause some like aggressive friction in my mind like he wants to be seen or oh, being aggressive against you now kind of thing i make fold which i'm happy about uh i've had to make some pretty big folds here actually so far yeah this, this final table has been more about all the folds you've made uh than anything yeah yeah and you know like the jacks jacks was wrong but the rest of them seem to be seem to be okay um but yeah it's kind of, it's interesting yeah, it, it is fun to sort of go back in time and, and it's funny to hear from your perspective that you've also, you know, you don't remember every hand. So it's kind of funny to look back and, and gauge whether your decision making uh, b between future or between uh, between past Patrick and current Patrick is still the same. Yeah, for sure. hundred percent. I don't remember this hand at all. So <laughs> I, I, I have no idea what happened here. There's so many, you know, like it's raise, defend, check, 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 whatever. You just don't necessarily remember. A lot of your energy... Uh, and memories comes from the big spots like the pocket jacks or where like I'm all in or whatever else. So um, yeah, these spots are quite interesting. Interesting that he's tanking so long and staring me down. Uh, maybe he's contemplating going all in, but 10-9 is such an unnatural hand to do that with. Uh, he's also changed his kind of mannerisms a little bit now. He was kind of hoodie over the neck before and now he's a little bit different, which is interesting. Oh yeah, he's back. He's back there, <laughs> never mind. Um, but you will see, like, I think, you know, I think it's good that he is like that. He's not doing anything crazy, like making poker boring or anything like that. He's just being, you know, I think it's every respect for that. I hope I see bet here, but, um, okay. That's good. Should face no check raises here. I don't think he probably will play a pure, just call or fold. I think. Cause this guy is going to be all in pre-pop with pocket sixes, all in with pocket eights. So, uh, if he has ace, queen, ace, king, he'll be all in free flop. He doesn't want to check raise a hand like ace two against me. So he's generally just going to, I don't, I don't see him folding, but let's see. We're still getting quite a lot of comments from people who are trying to decide how to spend that $42,000 that they uh, would have made oh, no. by calling with pocket jacks. Um, a lot of our smart smart investments, uh, people buying a hybrid car and a piece of land. I mean, that's oh, wow. that, I mean, on my YouTube channel, it was, it was like hookahs and blow. So, I mean, I like the guys here. They're, they're more professional, it seems. So that's good. I, th I think I think my audience is, is well past that phase. We've already grown out of that a little bit. Um, that's, good. that's good. I like it. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much for all the new Twitch followers that we are getting today on the show. It's getting it's getting too many to keep up with at this point, which is of course great news, and I appreciate everyone uh, chiming in. Um, uh, still, people wondering because we have a lot of new viewers. What are we What are we doing here? Well, that I wonder that every day of my life. What am I really doing? But in this case, we are watching a 2019 final table from the WSOP. It's a 3K no limit hold'em final table. Patrick Leonard, as you can see on the screen, is at this final table, and he's breaking it down with me right now. If you have any questions for him, please do send them into the chat. And if you enjoy the content, please like, follow, and subscribe. Do all that good stuff, and then I will keep this train rolling. On Thursday night, I do the show again. We do it twice a week, 8 p.m. Eastern time. We're watching season seven of High Stakes Poker. That's going to be a fun hangout. We're just going to have some banter, have some fun. I might crack open a beer or something and we'll just run with it. And that we're doing that because High Stakes Poker season eight is coming to Poker Go real sh uh, soon. Uh, December 16th, 8 p.m. Eastern time. All right. I think we missed the end of this hand here. Let me just go back real quick while I was jabbering away. Um, yeah. you, bet, you bet flop and it goes check, 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 check. Yeah, quite unfortunate. It may seem like a relatively small pot, but going the difference between having 2 million or 3 million here is so big. I would be second in chips if I win this pot. I would have more than Nole, more than Ivan. So now losing that one pot now put me down to the short stack. So those those pots are so crucial. Uh, and I'm not like uh, trying to say running bad or anything. I don't care, obviously. I'm just saying that those small pots are so crucial. And they also show how important they are to fight for too, right? Like I had a hand here, which I'd never bluff with, but winning those pots is so crucial and fighting for these kind of pots, which may seem like insignificant winning just two or three, like four or five big blind pots can make you second in chips or second last in chips. So yeah, unfortunate run up, but it, it is what it is. I won ace four against his pocket sevens earlier, whatever it was. So it's easy come easy go. Uh, Gillis has a very important question on Facebook. He says, was the facial hair like this, a playoff beard for the deep run? Uh, not sure. When you're in Vegas, you play every single day. So like, you don't really have time to go to the barber unless you're, especially if you're on like the final table, right? Because if you're on the final table, it's like you've played four or five days straight. So it's like you've, you've woken up every day, ran down to the Rio, came home, slept, 
all the time. So you don't even have time to do anything. So when you, whenever you're in a final table, unless you can get up in the morning and, and go to get your haircut or your beard cut or whatever it may be, you often come in like this. But usually, I, I think I was prioritizing running free flop sims instead of uh, shaving the beard. But maybe it would have been uh, maybe it would have been better. I may have called the jacks and had a better beard by the time. So well, maybe I shouldn't have run. I'm assuming that Gillis is a, is, is a hockey fan because hockey players never shave during the playoffs because the playoff beard supposedly brings good luck. So in that, in the, oh. in, from that perspective, WSB main event is the only tournament long enough to grow quite a bit of stubble during the event. Um, but I, I do think that you know, beard is, a, is, a, is an underestimated asset as far as uh, life goes. Um, here we are looking at uh, you with the 7-6 against uh, De Bernardi. Um, what, do you, what do you see here? You defend from the big blind, you flop a pair, um, backdoor straight draw. Very concerned. So he raises off 12 big blinds. So, you know, if he's raised folding, he should have a hand like ace eight, you know, ace nine offsuit or maybe ace two suited or something. So lots of his hands will have an ace. He'll have ace king, ace queen if he doesn't go all in. So I, I, I am quite concerned. But I'm not going to fold this hand just yet. He could have king queen or something. Really good turn card for me now. Uh, going back, I would 100% I would lead this turn million percent because... I have eight, nine, I have six, seven, I have seven, five. I have king, two of diamonds, whereas he has more ace, king, ace, queen. He's going to play this turn very, very passively. He's going to check ace, king. He's going to check ace, queen. So very important to lead this turn for me. Even if he has, yeah, yeah, very bad run out, but uh, very bad river. But I should definitely lead the turn here um, for sure. And in this case, I guess with the fourth diamond out there, all you can do is check and hope he checks behind. Um, he shouldn't have too many flushes, really. So I think I should bet. I hope I bet. I should bet like quarter pot, uh, like two hundred fifty k ish. Not sure what I go for there, but he doesn't have many flushes, right? Like he has ace king with the eight king of diamonds. He could bet the turn with this ace king offsuit might even go all in free flop. You know, like pocket kings he could have uh, with a diamond, but he has very few. He has very few flushes here. Like he doesn't have pocket nines with a diamond, right? Because pocket nines is all in free flop. He doesn't have pocket tens with a diamond because pocket tens is all in free flop. So he should just have like kings with a diamond, like very few flushes here, really. I don't I don't I don't really see how he has a flush unless it's the king unless it's the nuts. He goes all in, I think, which is very ballsy. Um <laughs> very ballsy, but a good bluff. Good bluff. Yeah, so when he moves all in here, um, how, how do you piece this together? Like, Because obviously, as you were just saying, um, there's not a whole lot that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not too concerned, really, because uh, like the worst, like it's a four flush board, right? So the worst hand I'm betting on the river is two pair. I have like one of my worst two pairs. So I, I will call this guy with lots of hands. If I have a flush, I will call him. If I have maybe even a straight, I may call him. I don't need to call every single hand I bet. So I don't even need to worry about it it's like if he bluffs if he bluff me and i have the worst hand i value bet it's okay like no problem I, I will still sleep tonight but if i fold like the second nuts and make some huge hero super fold for like some random reason and he shows me a bluff then i'd be like what am i doing like I, I shouldn't do that but yeah i have i don't need to lose sleep over that kind of that kind of fold i don't think and i can see in your eyes that you're you're feeling it sort of uh, slip away a little bit um talk to me about the emotional swings when a five-handed battle like this and a bracelet on the line just keeps going on and on and you're, make, you're in tough spots time and time again. Uh, is it hard to remain level-headed? Well, I think I think it's like, a, I, I see it as a test. I see it as, a, I've lost, say, seven pounds here, like either free flop made big folds or like run out four flush uh, or run out straight for no lay when I had ace nine against his 10-9. Or like, I believe that I've just had two pair against the flush. That's what I believe. So I'm thinking, okay, things are going really bad. Not getting much fortune here. No one's busting. Uh, when the short stacks are going all in and doubling up, the two guys have gone from 800K to 3 million and 2 million, whereas I'm now 800K. So I see it as a test, almost like a mental test. If these guys were dealt the same mental distribution as me, will they deal with it better than me? If not, then variance is a good thing, right? Because if everyone's going to deal with variance... Let's say 25% uh, of people quit the game because of variance and these 25% will win in players. That's great for me. If I stay in the game, but 25% of players who make money leave the game because of variance, then variance is my friend. It's not my enemy. 
So you have to see bad luck and bad fortune as a positive because other people will deal with it poorly. And if you deal with it good, then it's your friend, not your enemy. That's how I try to see it. I could be wrong. Maybe it's flawed, whatever, but I try to see poker like that. I try to see the mental side, the downsides of poker like that. But is is that a, a hindsight analysis or a, re a real time consideration? No, I'm chill. Like I, I'm, I'm quite chill when I play. Like you see, I'm just with my friends there. Like I, I'm not like beating myself up, hiding my hands. Like I'm like when I folded the jacks against the fours earlier on. You see, like I'm, I'm laughing with the guys. Like I enjoy. It. You have to enjoy the experience. Like you have to be chill. You have to. You can't allow yourself and your emotions to override you. I know poker is an emotional game, but you need to you need to control your emotions. It's a big part of, of playing well. Like Ivan here is a kind of player who is just like that too. He controls his emotions very well, very level headed. He I think they do lots of like meditation stuff. I really don't like meditation and yoga and all that stuff. It's like I'm not that guy at all, but I realize the benefits that they get from the meditation, I realize that they're important. So I try to try to try to do try to have those without doing the the meditation and in this case dara lo lo looks as though he's at a job interview waiting for his his place in line um but yeah he fl he makes uh, top two on the turn um gives us a chance to really look at chat real quick uh sherlock says this is a really cool show thanks for putting it on i appreciate you watching sherlock i hope you're still with us here uh and i see the followers coming in as well uh, please keep in mind i do this show twice a week every tuesday at 1 p.m eastern every thursday at 8 p.m eastern uh, and i have a variation of both guests and solo shows and on the solo shows we, we get a little wild sometimes give away some prizes do some fun stuff like that so uh, follow like and subscribe so you are notified of whenever the show Show goes on again. Uh, Zorop says, "I miss I miss Saturday live poker at the card room with a good beer." Uh, Patrick, have you started missing live poker yet? And, and is this contributing to it? We want to roll back just two seconds. I'll yes. show you something. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, just 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 um, further. Just 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 wait till you see the crowd. Just to let it go a little bit, I'll tell you when to stop. Um, we should see the crowd in uh, just one second. Um. Or was it before that? Did it not go far enough? No, just after this, I think. Yeah, so just stop now. So does, you may see that I'm talking to the guy with the French flag. I'm talking to the French fans. And obviously, Ivan is the French guy at the table, right? But the guy who I'm talking about, who's also talking with, who's also a Winamax pro, is Adrian Delmas. And I was living with him at the time. So Adrian was living with me in Vegas with Sam Grafton. It was me, Adrian, Sam Grafton. I think Reiner Kempe was there at the time too. But he's best friends with Ivan and they swap percentage in every tournament in their life. And I stake Adrian or I was staking Adrian. So there's this really weird dynamic where like Adrian was like telling hands for both of us. He had a percentage of him. I think I may have even swapped with him too, but like two people being so close to him, like he probably swapped with two or three people in that whole tournament. I don't know. There was like a thousand runners or whatever. Two of them have made the final table. One is his best friend and the other guy is me who's living with. So it's like a really weird dynamic because you'll see Ivan always goes over to him, but I'm also always, also going over to him. Like the guys next to Adrian on one side are my other housemates, Alex and Jason. And then the guys on the other side are Ivan's housemates. So like, it, I felt sorry for Adrian because he was right in the middle of this huge dynamic because even like blind versus blind confrontations, whatever it may be, like button versus small blind, we were playing loads of pots against each other. It was like this really weird dynamic for Adrian. So I just wanted to uh, to bring that up about missing the live poker. Not really. I, I'm I'm like I said I think I'm a better live player than online, but I I hate playing live. To be honest, I way way prefer playing online. I like to be in my office. I like to just you know be comfortable and. I get bored playing one table, to be honest. I like to have, you know, 12, 13, 14 tables up. So I'm not missing it. If anything, online poker has flourished during this time. I obviously don't like that there's a pandemic. I've I've been effective personally, which I won't go into. But um, poker-wise, uh, it's made online kind of bigger, which I'm not saying suits me because I don't want to play that narrative, but it's made more action and more opportunities in in that way um kind of thing so give us some background into what your daily routine looks like uh or has looked like this year and and what sort of buying levels you're grinding you you, you mentioned you know quite a few tables so uh, what's your approach to that and how how is that sort of routine so the actions kind of change throughout the year it's gone from high stakes to really high stakes to lower stakes to medium stakes when lockdown first started and corona first started there was a lot of higher buy-ins like 10ks 5ks 
uh, 25Ks, stuff like this. Um, a lot of friends have had lots of misfortune, so gone on very big downswings, lost big parts of their bankroll because the action has gone so high. I was very lucky to to um, I was very lucky to have a big score earlier in the year. I should have a water. I, I cashed a 25k for I think 1.65 million uh, in I think March or April. So that really kind of pushed my year on. I had a few of the scores. I think I won three scoops. I won two or three scoops. Um, I think I won a W Cooper two as well. So I've, I I've been very fortunate this year and ran very well myself. Uh, the, the routine now has slowed down. The high stakes have stopped. There hasn't been a scoop or W Coop or WPT for quite some time. So, um, yeah, now things have slowed down. But before, it was very action-packed, playing all day, studying all night. All the gyms were closed, so we were just, you know, McDonald's in, eat, eat, eat. But over the last couple of months, tried to get back to some kind of normality. Uh, you should have seen my beard in, like, June. <laughs> oh, I played yeah. online poker for, I don't know, three months in a row playing high stakes. My beard was out here compared to that. It makes me, makes me look clean shaven on this uh, final table there. Oh, that's so funny. But yeah, it's been a really strange year for everyone. And, and, and I'm sure that, you know, the people in the chat can speak to, um, you know, how you've approached this from a poker perspective. Have you, and let us know in the chat, have you played more poker, less poker? Um, are you studying more? Um, are you growing a massive pandemic playoff beard? Um, or as I have, are you getting into cycling, which is a thing you can do by yourself outside and you don't bother anyone? Um, back to the action. Patrick, you have uh, King, King Jack here. You are now the short stack. You can see I'm pretty chill now. Like to me now, I'm free rolling. Like I've got 500k. I'm just like glasses off, laying back. Like what I'm doing here is I know I'm going to go all in 100, but I'm trying to make it look like I have a weaker hand than I do, so that they're going to call me for like king two, king five, or something. I also do something here where I put in half of my stack. So basically, what happens here is let's say the button goes all in, the small blind goes all in, the big blind goes all in. I can just fold and keep you know two big blinds behind. The big blind folded king eight suited here, which is a huge fold. Um, yeah, huge fold. Like I'm going to shove seven eight suited, eight nine suited. Lots of lots of hands there. So I feel kind of. Um, I mean, I don't mind him folding because I've gone from 500k to 900k. That's how much dead money's in the pot. That's why I think we should pull very wide. Um, but yeah, back down to same scenario as last time. I guess I'll probably do the same thing. Put in half my stack. So I, I guess we're like one orbit later. You've paid some blinds and antis, and now you're back in the same spot. Bas basically, what you're waiting for is either you know getting a few shoves through in one orbit or to get a pure double up. Which look how much you lose per orbit. You lose three hundred thousand per orbit. It's huge. Like if I just go one more orbit without going on, I'm out the top. You know, <laughs> like it's crazy. Yeah, that, that is um, that is kind of nuts, actually. When you think about it like that. But yeah, I'm doing the same thing. I'm just working out what size I want to do. I'm probably going to put in like 350 or something. Like I know I say around 350, but I'm not even joking here. Um, let's have a look. So yeah, once again, you keep a few blinds behind just in case everyone else goes bananas. Uh, Ace four. Get it through. Like yeah, I'm loving this. I'm like, oh, let's go. Yeah. Uh, queen Queen six suited. Um, just a bit a, too loose. Ju just yeah. a bit too loose. What's the worst hand to call with there? Queen eight. Once you start dominating both cards, like I said, if I'm shoving seven eight, but I'm not shoving five six or something like this, you want to call the hands which will dominate the second card. It's like queen eight, king eight, jack eight suited even. Um, so people, if you're watching, write that down. This this is like a post-it type situation where you pl you place it on your monitor. You're like that is that is a little trinket of information that I think many of us uh, probably never consider. So if there's a chance you dominate both cards, the queen eight versus uh, queen six, um, then that's a, a spot worth considering, and it makes calling a bit a little bit easier. All right, here's no lay with uh, jack nine off on the button. This is this is a really interesting spot. So no lay should play extremely tight here because when he opens, the big blind can just put them all in. And that's terrible for him. He can't call with even pocket tens, pocket nines. If he folds, if he goes, if he raises, I won't shove that wide because I have no fold equity. But if he folds the button, I will go all in the small blind any two cards because of how big the pot is. And then the big blind is going to call me really wide. So I was really, really, really concerned to see him opening the button here. I thought it didn't make any sense to be wide here. In my, in my, in my opinion at the time, I was like, wow, he must have a really good hand because... You know, if he's raising jack nine, the big blind can go in with seven deuce 100% of the time. Obviously, he may think the big blind's too tight, 
So I didn't think the big blind was that kind of a tight guy. So I'm actually, I have a hand which is so good, ace four for four big blinds. I'm going to get blinded out, but I'm like, Jesus, this guy should have a really strong hand. So I'm concerned, but I just have to go with it. My hand is too, too strong. Even if he has kings, you know, I have 30% equity. So you do go for it. He doesn't snap me either. I don't think. And then he, he kind of knows he has to call obviously, but, uh, I'm surprised. I, I assume that I'm surprised to see Jack nine at least. Yeah. And you're in a good spot. Having, um, 59% here is obviously great. Yeah. To get my milkshake. <laughs> Was it, was it, I, I, the milkshake's so expensive and makes like $12 a pop. So every time I'm all in, I'm like slurping it down, <laughs> making sure I get every last cent of value in case I'm asked to leave the, uh, the place. I think I'm telling him, come on, bro. You spike calling me here. You can let it go. Oh, that's so funny. Um, while we watch this, uh, run out here, um, modern lurker on Twitch is asking as a short stack, can we just shove ACE four to maximize our fold equity versus, you know, as you did uh, race half your stack? Uh, it's not changing the fold equity. He's assuming that I'm all in basically anyway, so it's not going to change anything from his side. And if he puts in half his stack and then folds a flop, I mean, I'm loving life even more then. Good point. Um, uh, very, very, very beautiful uh, slot machine jackpot flop there, 777. Um, that would have paid out quite a bit at the Rio. Oh, it's a good flop for me as well because if he does hit a nine, I also have the, the, quad, the quad out on the river, so... See that that is the type of stuff that you should be should be thinking about. Um, do you do you call out cards? Are you quiet? What's what's your what's your all in approach? Uh, no, I, you can see I'm I, I'm actually like really chill when I'm all in. Like everyone's standing up, but I I'm quite relaxed. I'm just uh, I'm trying to think happy thoughts, you know. So trying to keep the <laughs> trying to keep the energy positive, trying to have fun. I mean, honestly, I, I really enjoy I really enjoy playing poker. You can see that even. When I'm short stack or whatever, I really do love poker. It's weird. It's a weird, but I just, I like the whole action. I love being the guy with four or five big blinds. I like that part of the grind. I feel like, oh, I can play five big blinds better than him. Or I can play five big blinds better than him. Like I enjoy having to make good decisions or like tough decisions or random decisions that you'd never study. Uh, so yeah, I like to, it's my friend Pone Diddy on Real Legend. Uh, I, I enjoy I don't know. It's quite geeky, like quite nerdy. I, I understand it'll come across maybe poorly to the Twitch chat or whatever, but I, I enjoy playing with five big blinds. I get almost a kick out of it. We should do a five big blind tournament. That'd be that'd be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm in. I'm in. Uh, Di Bernardi all in here with sixes on the button. Um, how how different is this from you know your situation with how short you were prior to doubling up and you know putting in a half stack raise? I would do the same. Okay. I would put in 500k uh, because you want to raise a size and where the big blind's not going to call, you know? So if you make it 500k, the big blind's not going to just call with like jack nine suited or whatever, you know? He's just going to go all in or he's going to fold. Um, but if you raise the 500k, small blind goes all in and then the big blind goes all in too, the big blind's always going to have aces, kings, queens, you know? And then the small blind doesn't have deuces or threes or fours or fives. So you can just let your hand go and still be left with 1.8 million, which is great. No late calls here, which is a big call for yeah i mean this is a this is a pretty i think this is a pretty crazy call uh for like you're calling off your tone like the button has to shove somewhat tight ish ish you know he, he does he does get to play aggressive but you don't dominate much with ace three you know like it's not like he has queen three or something but i think nole really loves to be chip leader like he takes a lot of future game into account so you know, he takes a risk with me with falls against Jacks. He takes a risk here because he knows that when he's chip leader, he plays so well. And if he can get chips, he'll win the tournament very often. Um, but yeah, this is a, for me, I'm loving life. I'm like, wow, he's called ace three. Like, I can get a ladder here. Do you know what I mean? Also, I think Nole is such a great player that, wow, Nole is likely to get busted here. Um, but when he gets the ace, I'm like, oh, if this is the worst case scenario kind of thing. Debo hates it as well. You can see he's trying to be composed. He's on TV for the first time. He's trying not to let out that frustration. But inside you're thinking, this bastard, you know, like, call me a the ace three. It's so unfair, but you know, like, when when the good players also hit the cards, it makes it even harder to play against them. Yeah, and they're getting massages. You know, his, his hands are out like the messiah, you know. Like, I don't know, he's, he's living life over there. Man, the one thing it makes me realize is with this pandemic look at that the double the double <laughs> four-handed massage 
<laughs> oh, he's like primed now to be to be back in contention. But the craziest part about watching this again is this is only a year ago, basically a year and a half ago, is how right now you know the face touching and the and the and the sh the massaging and the drinking at the table and the all the, the chips mm -hmm. exchanging hands. God, it, it feels like ten years ago, and I I have no idea how we're ever gonna safely get back to the because you know I know vaccine and social distancing and mask and all that stuff, but you know you can't deny that your mindset might forever be altered because of what happened this year. Hundred percent. 100%. It's pretty bizarre. Uh, for the people in the chat who are wondering when High Stakes Poker is coming back, it is coming back on December 16, and it's starting to air at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, Patrick, let me ask you real quick, uh, unless you're all in here. Um, let me ask you. Uh, it's actually very interesting. Mean, I think this one's actually quite interesting. I have a hand which is like not strong. But it feels too weak to fold. Uh, I hope I limp, but I may have folded or shoved in game. I think limping is superior, but the big blind has such a big stack that he can just... ICM is not a consideration for him. And if anything, he may take a shot to like, take me out. So I think shoving would be a mistake. But I call, okay, interesting. So you're going to try to see a flop here against uh, Daira from the So he's line. going to think my range is aces, kings, or complete air. I wouldn't be surprised if he raises here. Like he should be very aggressive typically because like, what what do I have, right? I'm limping off eight big blinds. I, I don't have pocket sixes. I don't have ace two, ace nine, ace 10, ace jack. Like I have literally the nuts, aces, kings, queens, jacks. Or I have like air, like when I say air, like weak hands like eight, five or, you know, six, seven offsuit or something like this. The hands that are just not strong enough to go all in like this kind of hand, I think. Um, so he can, and also when he raises, he can just raise a really small amount. He's not trying to make me fold king queen off. He doesn't have to put in four big blinds like you may do when you're deeper. He's trying to literally make me fold six, seven offsuit with his seven three. It's a very efficient kind of raise. So maybe he goes like 200k or something. I'm not sure what how big he went. It is interesting. I, it's I, an interesting I, dynamic though. I would have never considered this, and I think many of us um, would have also happily taken a free flop, but he makes it 390k, which... Yeah, min raise, right? It's 160 big blinds, so it's like 320 would be a min raise. So it's a pretty small raise, right? Like, if you think in big blinds, I'd limp for one big blind, and he raises the 2.1 big blinds. You know, it's like really small kind of raise size. I call, though. I'm not going anywhere with, with, with this hand. It's quite weird, right? I'm limping off eight big blinds, calling a raise. It's like, it's it's not something really that you would consider, but because the ante is so big, I realize the pot odds are a little bit better. And I also realize that when he raises, he's raising 9-8. He's not raising 10-8. He's raising like 8 deuce or 5 deuce. So I actually think that like I, I even dominate a lot of his range here as well. Like in a weird way, like my hand feels like I'm, I'm trapping him. I'm like, all right, he's got the 8 deuce. I'm going to get him. Um, but yeah, check, check on the flop, which is interesting when he has a pair. Uh, but do, do you he, think from his his perspective, he is just giving up now? Uh, not giving up at all. Like uh, on the flop, he's just doesn't want to get shoved on, I guess. But he's not going to fold if I bet the turn. Uh, but the turn is really good for his range. He has a lot of like ace, king, king, queen suited. Uh, some slow plays like aces or pocket jacks, whatever it may be. On the river here, I, st I hope I do. I please don't bet. Oh, okay, I check. Yeah, I should definitely check because if he has, say, seven deuce, I want him to bluff. Um, so yeah, it makes sense to check and, any and, hand that he will call me with. He would bet himself the value. So, and this is a very nice pickup there for you, uh, given your stack size. Huge, huge, yeah, <laughs> huge pickup indeed. Uh, for the people who are just chiming in, please keep the questions coming in the chat. We are live on Twitch, on Facebook, and on YouTube. Uh, question coming in from John Mann on Facebook saying, "Hi Patrick, um, what win would you say changed the course of your poker career? If if any one moment or win uh, stands out for you." There's a few, like the first one is I was a cash game, professional cash game player. I didn't play tournaments at all. And then I had uh, a two week run where I won like 250K playing tournaments, which I just ran way over EV, obviously. Um, so I um, that would be number one because it changed my career from a cash game player who was going for Supernova Elite to a tournament full-time player. Second one would be in Vegas. I had back-to-back-to-back uh, -back -to -back wins three days out of five in Vegas for like 1.2 million. Uh, and then the third one would be this big score I had a few months ago on GG Poker, which was uh, 1.6 million or something. All three of them had different, they did different things to my career at different times kind of thing. 
Um, but probably the most important was the one which made me move from cash games to tournaments. This is an interesting hand here. Uh, he went all in from under the gun. Like all in is is quite big, right? He can just min raise and put pressure on everyone. So he went all in here. So I was kind of I thought he's got ace x a lot. So like ace five, pocket twos, pocket threes, pocket fours, pocket fives. I thought if he has a hand like king eight or king nine, he's gonna just raise fold. So I don't think I dominate much here very often. I think I'm flipping sometimes. I think he has an ace sometimes. He sometimes has like seven, eight suited or nine, eight suited, which if he shows me nine, eight suited here, I'm probably supposed to fold because it's not like I dominate him. Like I, I'm flipping to go out the tournament kind of thing. And if I double up, I don't go chip leader or anything like that either. So pretty close one, the king, queen suited, I think. And if you, if you had been the shortest stack, would have been a much easier decision? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so in that yeah. case, you would make the call, of course. Um, what else we got going on in the chat? Please keep it up, you guys. Uh, Darren, Daniel, I see you guys in the chat. Appreciate you watching. Um, let's see on Twitch. Twitch is Twitch is pretty lively. I love it. I appreciate you guys all. And so many followers coming in, which is great. I see S-Dub, um, R-Snipple, Paul Ray, Fishing Bud, Fire Guns, Donkey Ton. A lot of new faces and new names on the show today. I do the show twice a week, by the way, every Tuesday, every Thursday. Uh, the early show, that's today. Uh, which is also why it's bright and sunny. I'm in Las Vegas hosting the show. And then the night show is every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. All right, here's Dyra again with the race. And then De Bernardi as the short stack with King Queen suited. <laughs> Funny enough, the hand you had just uh, just one hand before this. Obviously, pretty straightforward shot from him here, right? Yeah, like Ivan's going to have King 2 offsuit, which he's going to be priced in with. Like, he's going to race so wide here with a 6.5 million stack. Um, that yeah, King Queen is really doing well here because he's going to have King Sevens, King Eights, King Nines. It's quite tough for even. I think he can't fold. It's just too shallow. He's getting too good of a price. He beats some hands, like he beats King Queen. Interesting spot. Of course, De Bernardi um, has a lot of incentive to shove because he is the short stack. It's quite, it's quite interesting for me as, as, as a guy on the table. Like, do I want him to call or not? Because often he's, when he takes this long, I know he has a terrible hand. So I'm like, okay, he's going to be so dominated here so often that the short stack's going to double up. And now I'm set to be the short stack. So I'm like, do I even want him to call? Maybe I want him to fold. Um, because if he does have, say, ace king here, I'm likely going to finish fifth in the tournament. Do you know what I mean? So it's an interesting one for me too. I never leave my seat. I don't know. Everyone loves to leave their seats, don't they? I mean... Maybe I, maybe I end up leaving my CT here, but I don't know. I like to I like to be in there, watch watch the cards come down. I don't know. Yeah, pull the old pull the old Phil lock and stand behind the dealer and look from the side to see if you can be the first one to uh, to sweat the cards as they come out. Um, but yeah, everyone's going to their rail, and you're just you're you're like you know making sure the chips are safe, just uh, sitting there protecting them at the table. Yeah, yeah, that's a great flop. We love to see that. There we go that is looking more and more like a pay jump. Um, for the people who are wondering, there were 671 players in this tournament, 380K up top, and of course, a WSOP gold bracelet. Fifth place gets 81K, fourth place gets 114, uh, then 162, 234, and as I said before, $380,000. Um, fun little side down here as we see De Bernardi get eliminated. Andras Nemeth, um, uh, top crusher, big high stakes online player. He finished in seventh place in this event. Um, mm -hmm. And and it's probably uh, great for you that someone like that um, gets busted out before the final table. I have so, so much history with him. I, I mean, I, I played so much against him in this tournament, obviously, because he finished seventh, I finished wherever I finished. So yeah, it was so much. He's the kind of player where there's just fireworks. Like with a lot of these players, it's a lot of small ball and, you know, small parts and check, 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 check. With Andras, it's just so different. It's all big pop poker, lots of action free flop, so many all ins. I, I was actually all in with him, uh, seven left for all the chips, I think. I had ace king, he had ace queen, and we get it all in. And the board came out queen high, and I was ready to get my back back on. And it ran out like, it ran out like, Jack 10 King, so we both had Broadway. So I, I was so relieved. It was like, I don't know, six million chip pot at the time. That was huge. I was so relieved to chop, you know, after getting in so good that it's just whenever you play against him, you just play in huge pots against him. I also beat him with 10 8 suited all in against like Ace Jack or something as well for a huge pot. There was just, 
yeah, he, he's a player where there's big, big action. That's for sure. Uh, for the people on Twitch who are wondering if there's a delay, no, there is not. We are doing live commentary on a final table from 2019. So no need for a delay. This action has already happened. If you want to watch old high, st high stakes poker or World Series of Poker final tables, it's all available on Poker Go. I pick and choose from the archives uh, fun things to watch, and then we break it down with the guests on the show. So uh, this is only the second time we're doing it on Twitch, but we will going forward do every single one of these shows on Twitch as well. So I appreciate you guys all watching. We got the most questions coming in from Facebook today, which I appreciate. Um, uh, Mark asks, what's the best place to play uh, online poker for real money? That depends on where you live, Mark. So go and do some Google research. That's the best way to find out. It's kind of tough for me and Patrick to analyze that. And of course, you know, can't recommend uh, any site based on where you are. Um, Joseph is asking uh, the best ways to start playing poker as a beginner. Well, I know this is a topic we could spend nine hours on, but Patrick, um, a few sort of this is this is a this is just a very crucial uh part Pot? okay um, let's let's watch the hand first. first first of all we can see that he's raising king nine rather than shoving so my assumption last orbit that he wouldn't shove these king nines i dominate probably correct but i have a hand here which i believe is strong i believe unless i'm misreading the situation yeah i have king jack so the way that i'm thinking here is that this guy's shoving when he has an ace. He's shoving when he has pocket pairs. When I go all in, his raising range is basically aces, kings, queens, jacks, tens. Then it's loads and loads of bluffs. So I'm going to go all in here because my hand is really good. He's raising so wide. And if it's a hand like jack 10 or queen 10 or nine eight, he can't call me because my range is strong. So when he has king nine here, I'm fully expecting him to fold. Uh, even though I'm going all in for like 8.5 big blinds, whatever it may be. I still pretty sure that he's going to fold. I think I guess I have 1.4 million or 1.3 million. So that's like eight big blinds. Um so I'm like pretty sure that he's going to fold because he doesn't snap call me. So I know he doesn't have aces, kings, queens, jacks, or tens. And I know that if he has nine eight suited, he's already going to be all in free flop. So I'm like, what's he tanking with? Because if he has king two or you know, queen seven or whatever it is, he's just gonna fold, right? Uh, so I'm just I don't know if he's Hollywooden or what's going on. But then something, then, uh, yeah, then something big happens. Let's turn up the audio and listen in on this one for a sec. To do so, I'm not sure what the math indicates in this I mean, particular yeah, he's spot. He's getting two to one. I mean, it's, you know, against, against Leonard's range, you, you would assume that he wouldn't be this bad in this bad shape. Yeah, the, but again, look at how hesitant he is. You know, Leonard has played so, so ridiculously tight. Yeah, Leonard doesn't like to put it in. I mean, he could have just called. And But does it change things now that he is the ultimate short stack and these stacks have really, you know, they're fighting for this third place, this fourth place finish. And, uh, you know, that's that's the situation. That's why Deira is really conflicted here. I mean, the funny thing is, I'm like, begging Patrick, obviously, would... I know I have him completely dominate, obviously, because if he has, he always has, like, either a king high or a queen high or a jack high, right, with tank, and he doesn't have, say, 7-2 offsuit here. He's just going to definitely fold. And he's never going to fold an ace. So I'm like, please call. You know, he might do the same sort of thing with the ace-deuce, the ace-three like he had just a moment ago. Here it is. Smile on Patrick's face. Look. Yeah. And you remain seated once more as you were all in for your tournament. I think life. I may stand up here because I'm so surprised, I think. I think I may go to my friends and just, like, speak to them about it. I'm, I'm, maybe not. I don't know. I know I was shocked at the time. I mean, you are in a great spot to uh, to double up and to you know get really back into the race for the win, um, as Dara, um, you know, is dominated here with the uh, king king nine versus your king jack. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's but you know you, you you know what I liked here. If you just pause it a second, yeah. Uh, if you can go back to the flop and then just pause it after the flop, something really interesting is uh, you'll see something. The French rail are the wildest rail out of all the rails. They're very loud, very energetic. You'll see something here which is quite interesting. Oh my, my picture is a little choppy right now. So let's hope it catches up. Do you see all of his rail? Nobody celebrates. So like. There's such a big respect between like me and my friends and, and those guys. Like they are so loud on every all in. You, you can hear the French singing national anthem, whatever else from, from halls down the Rio all the time. If they win an all in, it's huge cheering. 
but it's such a big respect kind of thing between certain professionals and like when you play so much together and you know that it's such a brutal all in against somebody who you're kind of not necessarily even friends with but kind of just you've traveled the circuit with we both live in london we have this mutual friend adrian you can see that there's just no real like like the guy's gonna win a huge amount of money here by winning this all in but his whole rail is just like they're just staying chill like adrian's still sitting down you know what i mean like it's uh I, i'm not ready to go of course but uh, I, I really respect that and really appreciate that, that they were so polite with their celebrations, if that makes sense. Because, of course, they've just won a pot worth, you know, $100,000 or whatever this equity is worth, more, you know, 150000 So I really respect that. And uh, I don't take that lightly, you know, like I, I acknowledge that a lot. And you're, you're doing the, the, classic, uh, the classic run good thing, which is packing all your things. Um, it didn't work. Oh, yeah. I mean, Evan's gone from 800,000 to 8 million here, you know? So, I mean, I kind of expected it at this point. I was like, okay, maybe not the wrong, the right one for me. You, yeah. Is, is it, so looking back on this final table, of course, you know, we, we've seen you make some huge folds. So we've seen you in some really, really tough spots. Um, what's your general feeling looking back on this final table? No, like with, with, um, with like pride rather than regret, you know, like, uh, I, I thought, I think I played, played good. I think I didn't really have any like, you know, aces or Kings or anything like this. When I flopped top set, it ran out quite badly. Like I'm not trying to moan at all, like finishing fourth in any tournament, you have to run extremely well to get there. Like I said, I, I beat Andres Nemeth's, uh, ace Jack with 10, eight suited like final three tables or something. So you have to run well to get anywhere. But on the final table here, I think I played as well as I could do with the cards. If I'd pulled the jacks, I'd probably be doing this podcast with my bracelet on right now. But, you know, it is what it is. And uh, it's fine. I, I, I can accept that. I can forgive forgive that. No problem. Uh, for the people in the chat who are wondering, well, is it over now? No, we're going to we're gonna run this thing out. We're going to make sure that we catch the winner here on the stream. So you got a few more minutes left. We're going to watch the final few hands here of this final table. Uh, so if you have any questions for Patrick, please keep them coming. Um, back to the question Joseph asked. And, and of course, this is a far too large a question to answer quickly. Um, but he's asking for advice on how to start beginning as a poker player. Is there any one direction you'd like to point him in? Um, at the very, very beginning, I would recommend playing heads up, sitting goes. Heads up, sitting goes basically teach you how to play in position and how to play out of position. You play in hands every single time, so it's not like you're waiting around board. So yeah, heads up, sitting goes when you're a true, true, true beginner. Try to learn, try to understand board textures, try to understand bet size, and it's it's the best thing to do. Then I would probably recommend going one step further into sitting goes. So you start learning about payout structures, different stack sizes, all ins. Uh, people limping all sorts of stuff like that and then from there once you get good i'd then go to say uh multi-table sit and go so like 18 mans 27 mans then when you understand them you can then start going to 90 mans and then move your way up to tournaments so i always think start out with two players go to six go to nine go to 18 try to build your way up so you're slowly learning different parts of tournaments uh until you become well versed in all of them essentially yeah, and there's there's tons and tons of options for that as well. And I could always recommend, you know, play well within your bankroll because the swings are crazy when you are playing poker, especially online. You burn through money real quick. So please, please be safe. Please be careful. Uh, Samad watching from Iran. He says he just started watching. He's going to watch it all again uh, once the show finishes. So appreciate you watching as always. Um, Sebi says... I'm all in here. Should be all in call, I think. Sixes versus sevens. You, did, you didn't stick around, I bet, for, for the... For the rest of the final table. I went to get another milkshake, I think, and, I, and then I jumped into another tournament, I, I guess. I mean, you could barely afford another one after finishing fourth, so... Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, we joke, we joke, but no one knows the All-American Day prices. They're, they're big. <laughs> they are big. Uh, 24 bucks for a, for a meal. Um, any Anything you notice from this hand? Like, anything you see about uh, either one's play, um, standard or not? With sevens, I would induce. So I would raise and then call a shove because I want them to shove with pocket twos, pocket threes, pocket fours, pocket fives, ace five. I think sevens is too strong of a hand to shove. Um, but you get to call by sixes, which is a good call because when you have sixes, you expect the player to have deuces, threes, fours, and fives. Never eights, nines, tens, jacks, queens. So you're not dominated very often here at all. Somehow he is this time by a hand, which he probably shouldn't be anyway, I imagine. So yeah, he he's unfortunate to run into sevens here, I think. 
No let dominate it here. Uh, Sebi is asking, um, got plans to keep running it back once High Stakes Poker starts up again? Yes, Sebi. I will keep doing this show twice a week for all of eternity uh, or at least until you guys start stop liking the video. So if you, if you guys stop liking the video, if you guys stop commenting, I will stop doing the show. But if you guys keep engaging with me and keep having fun, I will keep doing the show and we'll do some Poker After Dark. We'll have Phil Gelfand on the show. We'll watch some PLO action. We'll get Joey Ingram back on. We'll get Matt, Matt Berkey back on. Maybe some, some superstars. Maybe Phil Locke will even join me uh, to watch some High Stakes poker or you know if i can get sammy farha on the show wouldn't that be something uh, so anyway yeah this show continues as high stakes poker returns um, but we might pivot into some different forms of content as we head into uh, the new year uh, and 2021 of course hopefully we get to break down some more uh, live events you know with the vaccine maybe we'll be up and running again in a few months who knows uh, hard to say at this point but uh, definitely curious to see um, how that's going to go. All right, seven on the turn here. You you would think that seals it. However, uh, Nolet pick up pick up picks up more outs than he had before. Mm -hmm. Never easy. Never. The one time you don't want to hit your set right there. I, I have no idea what comes. <laughs> Let's see what the river card is here. It is an eight. The boat fills up, and Nolet gets eliminated in third place. We are down to heads up action. Um, Let's see. We've got a few questions here for you. Um, let's well played, Nolay, by the way. Legend. Absolute legend. On and off the tables. One of the nicest guys. Uh, Tilt City. Um, um, quite an applicable name here for the question. He says, Pads, what's an acceptable amount of binds to lose at, at nine max sit and goes before calling a session quits? So I guess uh, it's a bit of a stop loss question. Uh, it depends how you get affected, obviously. Um, but I would say, you know, if you lose, say, 10 binds, I would take a break sure um, but it's easy to lose if you just play a bunch of sit and goes you can easily go on these kind of down swings for sure um so yeah i mean, i think each each person some people i think it's good to stop if in cash games for example if you lose one buy-in it's good to maybe take a break two minutes stop but some guys maybe they're not affected at all and they just don't ever take a break until they finish their session so i think doing what's right for you is better than doing what I think's right because each person has different tolerance to to, to the downswing. Sorry that that's a, uh, not completely answering the question, but I don't want to recommend you to do twenty buy-ins <laughs> and then you know you tilt off the rest kind of thing. Uh, twenty buy-ins that, that's my whole bankroll. So, um, Don yeah. Don is asking, um, what were your thoughts on the overall standard of play for the WSOP in twenty nineteen? So this this tournament here is after the main event. So this tournament, everyone's max punting like everyone's all in like gambling just wants to go home so this tournament was all about waiting for the cake waiting for people to just give you the present on the river kind of thing actually interested in this tournament i played against dennis blyden you know dennis blyden yeah um this was the last tournament he ever played and i knocked him out of it wow which is which is quite interesting yeah and i remember remember quite strongly playing against him kind of thing as well so that was what i remember most from this tournament was one everyone was punting and two, I played. He is this time I played against him. Um, yeah, this was after the main event. It's kind of the summer saver, let's say. People are trying to save their summer with this tournament. Uh, most of this tournament, I just played. Um, most of this tom most of this summer, I just played mixed games. So I didn't play much hold'em at all. I was playing Omaha High Low and Raz and Stud and all these silly games. I'd never played them before, so I came to Vegas to kind of have fun and play the mixed games and I'd never really played them too much just in scoops and W coops never played a live tournament of them before and uh, I was on a fantasy team Ryan Reese's fantasy team and uh, we, we ended up winning the uh, the fantasy thing all of us got good points in the end I think and obviously this final table helps uh, towards my overall points as well yeah and I, I bubbled that so thanks for reminding me of that it was great I'm oh, sorry <laughs> no I was doing a team with Brent Hanks and and uh and some help from Daniel Negrano, but it's always fun to be involved in the fancy draft. That actually makes me miss WSP even more. All the time I spend researching the team and doing the auction draft and being involved in that, it's always a lot of fun. Um, all right, you guys can see the the, the hands-on screen. This will, this will be ending pretty soon. There are heads up. Daira has a big chip lead. Um, so we're, we're going to tackle a few more questions here before we get towards the end of the show. Um, what else do we see here in the chat? Lots of action in the chat. That, that's, that's cool. Um, Jet... Jedi Mino says, can we expect Patrick to do more uh, tournament re reviews in the future? I mean, you're doing it on your YouTube channel, right? Yeah, I do two or three videos a week on my YouTube channel, yeah. Um, sometimes live commentary, sometimes breakdowns afterwards. Um, 
yeah, they've been popular so far, so I'll carry on carry on doing them for now and uh, see how it goes. Yeah, we can just you yeah. you you and I can do some more breakdowns of other final tables on this uh, on this very show. Yeah, of course. I have to, hopefully I can make some, next summer we make some next game final table, and then you can teach me Deuce to Seven. Uh, <laughs> final table i'll just sit back and listen to you <laughs> oh man we should actually do we i should actually do one uh, of those streams but I, i'm not sure if many people in the chat would be uh, too excited about watching um, a non holdem variant um by the way um yeah. it ends I mean, it, it's fun we can teach them to love it right that's true. That's true. Uh, this tournament ends with a swing for the fences as Gonzalez moves all in with the five deuce and Dyra calls it off with his uh, full house, with his kings. And of course, a massive win for him. His first WSOP bracelet. And as you said before, the French are cheering loudly, possibly uh, turning this into the national anthem at some point. Uh, Dyra visibly uh, emotional. Uh, that is, of course, a massive moment. Uh, Patrick, how much will it mean to you? And, and, and let me emphasize the word will. Will it mean to you when you ultimately uh, get to win your first bracelet? I mean, it, re it really, I don't mean this in a bad way, but it really doesn't mean that much to me. Um, so like, even some of the most recognized players in the game, like people with five bracelets, four bracelets, six bracelets, like I've looked at what they've won them in. It's like a lot of 50 runner fields, 60 runner fields, 70 runner fields, 80 runner fields. Um, I don't really have too much prestige around bracelets. I think, um, yeah, I don't. I just personally don't have too much. I get more prestige over maybe like a scoop or W coop or WPT. Um, I, maybe that's because I enjoy them more playing online, or maybe it's like a little bit more competitive when you get to a final table of a really high stakes online buy-in. Uh, it's often a really, really high standard. So to win that final table. You it like luck is important, of course, always, but you need to have been playing absolutely amazing as well. So I don't get too much prestige from the live stuff. And I don't chase it too much, but um, I can see why others do, of course, but it's not me personally. Right. Well, thank you so much for being with me here on the show today. For everyone who is still watching, please smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, do all the good stuff. Find Patrick on his YouTube channel as well. And uh, I promise we will do another show uh, together at some point in the future. Maybe we can do some mixed games. Maybe we'll do some some different final tables. Maybe I'll hit you with the with the, with the, with the crazy one. You know, do like a, a 1990 WSOP final table from, uh, oh, wow. from, from way, way yeah, back no. in the day. That would be fun. That would be All right, very, nice one. very interesting. Sounds good. All right, you guys. Thanks. Thank you. I, let me just Thanks. direct myself to the audience here for just a second. I'll be back on Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern time, watching High Stakes Poker Season 7 featuring Jason Mercer, Barry Greenstein, uh, Bill Perkins, Horalibus Vulgaris, all in action there on Season 7. Until then, this was Run It Back, and I'll catch you guys on Thursday.